Yay. It shows live on my side, Troy. I think that's a good sign. Well, it's saying on mine so far, redirecting. OK. And then I've got to turn this volume off on the Facebook. It is off. On the Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're good to go, Neil. Hi, Troy. Hi, Neil. How's the How boss? I'm doing well. <laughs> good. For those that are watching, we just happen to have a little, a little delay, but. Well, that's because I'm involved and that's what you should expect. People don't expect me to be on time, Troy. You, on the other hand, I mean, it's, it's, it's my fault. I made you late. Let's go with that. Okay, we'll go with that. Yeah. But again, we'll, like last time, we'll blame it on the bossa nova. Yes. Who was that? It was one of the Connies, Francis or Stevens. I can't tell them apart. <laughs> uh, Francis, she had that ballad. Where the boys are? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> How would I come up with that one? Yes. <laughs> I don't know about any hits for her. She, I have a, a twist album by her on open reel tape, and it is splendid. That is cool. I didn't know she did a twist album. Very nice of you to say that it's cool. <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> yeah, okay. That doesn't qualify it as cool, but, you know. <laughs> knowing, knowing who I am. <laughs> I think um, any anybody that's here to see me that doesn't know too much about who you are should have head over to the qc hive today and make a donation well that's very kind of you <laughs> how about that troy wrangle is the recipient of the day for the qc hive that i am yeah and a very worthy one at that Two days and worth. also also you and i have a gig a week from tonight from six to eight thirty six six to eight thirty six thirty to eight 6.30 to 8. I had the 30 in the wrong place. 6.30 yeah. to 8 at Vanderveer Park, which is within walking distance of me. Yeah. And it'll be yeah. with uh, Chris Castle, Kathy Caparula, Ron Wilson, and Manuel Dude Lopez. The third. Yes. And three. That'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. So looking forward to that. I am too. Already. All Can right. Neil will... I guess we can start. Um, if somebody's new to this, I interviewed you maybe a month ago or whatever, and, and we took it up to high school, almost a little college. And so mm -hmm. we're going to continue from there. So I'm just going to ask you, um, again, because you kind of mentioned college, but you, you left your town, Princeton, right? Yes, Princeton, Illinois. And you were going to pursue, I'm guessing, a music degree of some sort? Yeah, well, I didn't know any better. Um, I had made, <laughs> in high school, um, just because there, there weren't a lot of saxophone players in my district, I made Allstate Jazz Band two years, my junior and senior year of high school. And that led me to believe that it's like, hey, I think I'm on to something here. I'm pretty good. One of the best players. I wasn't one of the best players in the state. It's just how they do it in Illinois. I was one of the better players in the district who auditioned that day. And so I got to go to Allstate. And my senior year, um, the guy who was directing the district jazz band was the saxophone professor at Illinois State. And... Um, he impressed me because he didn't seem like a professor. He was pretty laid back and he was talking really casually and everything. So, um, I thought I want to study with that guy. So that, that was me deciding on which college to go to. <laughs> so that led you to Illinois state. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. Illinois state, the Kmart of education. <laughs> yeah. Now, while you're there, I'm, Again, I'm guessing you played in ensembles and stuff like that, but did you do any outside gigs, like outside of the school type things? No. Yet? Well, there was one. There was one, and it wasn't good. Um, 
as a music major at Illinois State, you had to be in a performing organization. Um, and everybody tried to audition into the top orchestra or the top concert band or the wind ensemble or the top performing jazz ensemble. If you didn't make one of those, then you would you would need to perform in the marching band or the university concert band or something else. They had these these other groups that you know, people wanted to audition out of. And I didn't know how to audition. I didn't know anything. And my, my audition was me walking into the, to this uh, beatnik professor's office. And um, he said, well, what do you got prepared, man? And I thought, it's like, I, I thought you were going to make me read stuff. You know, I didn't know. And he goes, oh, play, play something, man. And I played that saxophone riff from The Stranger by Billy Joel. Oh, okay. Da, 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 da. That's what I played. And looking back on that, I don't know how I made that jazz band. Wow. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Um, he didn't ask me to play scales or anything. It's just I played that, and he goes, oh, okay. And, and I was in, second chair. Nice. You and I was in the... Uh, just the way you are, Phil, with solo... Well, that was alto. Oh, that's true. Yeah. 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 That one, that would have gone out of range for a tenor. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was weird. Um, I was, I was freshman. So I was, I was tenor two in, in the top jazz band and the, the lead tenor player, tenor saxophone player was a guy named Jack Waltrip. And he, he looked different because this was 1981 and he, he wore his hair in a ponytail and he had a goatee, which was really uncommon, and a mustache. And he wore sunglasses a lot, and he had a leather gig bag. And I thought that guy was so cool. And when I would walk into the rehearsal space for the jazz band, it was in a recital hall, he would, he would already be there. I would get there early. He'd already be there, and he was playing into a, one of the concrete walls. And he'd just be playing patterns and, you know, I was afraid to talk to the guy because he was good. And um, he graduated with a band and orchestral instruments degree. And the summer after he graduated, which was the end of my freshman year, he toured with Miles Davis that summer. In the band or as an yeah. opening? Year? No, he really? was in Miles Davis's band. Yeah, he was he was in the group with Miles Davis. Whoa. I'm sure that's documented. Some Jack Waltrip was his name. Is his name? He's in Colorado now. I think. Really good player. But I mean, he was he was a Coltrane. He played played the patterns, you know, okay. played patterns over changes and things like that. I played mm -hmm. emotionally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so after, I mean, we'll kind of rush through the college thing because you mentioned you didn't really play too much outside of college. I had one gig. I should probably mention that um, my beatnik saxophone professor sent me on a gig he didn't teach me anything he didn't teach me scales didn't teach me repertoire hi professor boydus if you're listening <laughs> I, want, I want my money back he didn't prepare me for anything i was a performance major he sent me on a gig and he gave me the address it's like i got a gig for you man and he gave me the address and he um and the time and everything like that. It was like at an Elks club or something like that. So it's the kind of gigs that I started doing when I started playing in the Quad Cities. And these were people a generation or maybe a generation and a half older than me. And I got there with my saxophone. I just expected that they would have music for me to read. I had no idea, nothing, no idea of anything. I didn't know any jazz standards. And so uh, I was like, well, okay, well, let's get started. <laughs> I'm like, going, well, what am I supposed to do? Um, well, let's do, uh, let's start with all the things. I don't remember what songs they were calling, but there were songs I didn't recognize. Uh, let's do all the things you are, Stolen by Starless, whatever. Like, do you know that mm -hmm. one? It's like, no. <laughs> oh, well, um, well, let's do, um, yeah, I, let's do Summertime. And then, so they're naming all these tunes and it's like, I've, I've heard of it. I've never played it. And they're, they were really patient. They were really patient. And so they said, well, do you, uh, CJM Blues, do you know CJM Blues? Let's do that one. Um, no, <laughs> so I got two notes in it. Um, so they played a couple tunes and I improvised and then they sent me home after the first set. Oh, I don't, I don't remember if I got paid and I wasn't smart enough to be embarrassed by that. 
I just thought, well, that's a weird gig. They didn't have anything, you know? Yeah. You didn't realize it was <laughs> how it goes. <laughs> and I, I wasn't even embarrassed enough to say something to my professor. I was like, what was that all about? <laughs> I really should have stood up to that guy on a number of different occasions. He didn't teach me a thing. I would, I would go into his office and I would play for half an hour and he'd laugh and he'd go, man, you need to work on that. See you next week. <laughs> oh, okay. I need to work. Okay. <laughs> I'd never had lessons, but not really. I'd never really had lessons before. I took violin lessons when I was in high school, but I didn't know. I just figured he's a really good player and I should be. And Jack Waltrip got something out of him. I mean, what was that all about? How come <laughs> yeah. I didn't learn that? And maybe Jack Waltrip was just, maybe he knew what he wanted to do and he found the material and Professor Boyd has just stood back and watched and took credit for it. I don't know. Yeah, that's Honestly, I don't know. It, he sure is. <laughs> <laughs> and he's also the reason I didn't graduate because um, as a performance major, I was required to give a senior recital. And um, the administration had let me know a few months before my senior recital was due that my recital needed to be classical saxophone. Oh, and so, you know, rather than me standing up for myself, it's like, what am I supposed to do with that? Um, I, I got some classical repertoire and, you know, I had a jazz mouthpiece on my horn. I couldn't afford a second mouthpiece. Um, so I played, for, you know, it had to be approved by a jury of faculty members. And so I played and um, the comment was made that it sounded like a jazz guy trying to play classical music. And I thought, well, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much what you're getting here. And they didn't approve it. So I didn't graduate because I didn't give my recital. I was an undergraduate teaching assistant, and I had my own office grading papers for music theory students, and a 3.75 out of 4 GPA, and I didn't graduate because I didn't do my recital. But so I'm a, I'm a college dropout. That makes me a rebel, which is even more. Com yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I would have thought you would have uh, your. Uh, instructor there would have at least have let you known about the gig like what to expect there was he didn't tell me anything <laughs> he didn't prepare me for anything like buy a, um, or a fake book or something you know ahead no, of time i didn't know those i didn't know they existed i didn't know there was protocol for doing a jazz gig he the only time he the only time that he mentioned a jazz tune for me to learn was Giant Steps, which was ridiculous because that's a huge leap from somebody who's never learned a jazz standard to going to Giant Steps. And for anybody who's listening that doesn't know what Giant Steps is, it's insane. It goes through all 12 keys in, is it 32 bars? I don't know. I, but anyway, the, I, I, I would do music manuscripts for the music department. If somebody needed something transposed, this is in the early 80s before notation software existed. So I would do it by hand, India ink on paper. And if a vocal major needed something in a different key for a recital, I would transpose the piano part. So the piano part would, you know, that's what I did. And I charged $5 a page. Um, and this professor asked me to, it's like, hey, man, you should transcribe Giant Steps by John Coltrane. So I went to the record store. I bought the record. And I'm listening to it. It's like, ba da 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 It's like, okay, okay. I, can, I think I can do this. And he goes, It's like, what? Like, there's no way. And it didn't even occur to me that this is, I'm probably being pranked. I went to the listening library at the, at the, on campus. I recorded it onto a reel-to-reel -reel tape and slowed it down to half speed because I had the mm -hmm. album. And so I recorded the album, 33 and a third, and I, I recorded it on a, a fast speed reel-to-reel -reel tape and slowed the tape down to half half speed, and it dropped it and knocked it. And then it was, now instead of going, do ba da ba da ba da ba it was going, bruh, 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 bruh. <laughs> and that I could manage. And I was petrified that he was going to ask for it like in a month or three weeks or something like that. I was frantically working on this. And he didn't ask for it. And finally, I said, I finished this giant <laughs> steps. You asked me to write this out. And he goes, oh, man, you can go up to the music store and buy that, man. You should learn yeah. that. You should like learn. You should learn that, man. You should like not just learn it, but learn it in three keys. So and 
again, time after time, it didn't even occur to me. It's like, I should start questioning this guy. It's like, oh, oh okay, I'll learn it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I learned it. I learned it in three different keys and he never asked to hear it. And I didn't oh. want to play it for him. Every time I think of that song, you get a headache. Yeah, no wonder. And it, you know, it's a, it's a jazz masterpiece. I'm not denigrating John Coltrane or anything. It, it's a, it's a wonderful piece of music, and it, it changed everything for tenor player, tenor saxophone players. And it was John Coltrane proving that he could do something that no other player could do, which was kind of the point in the civil rights era. You know, being a, you know, jazz player, a black man at, at that time. You know, yeah. here's here's something that, you know, jazz is the music, jazz was music that, you know, that he had a birthright to, and he was going, it's like, we're taking it back. So I, I admire the song and what it means, but I didn't have any business playing that thing. Yeah. And you've got bad <laughs> with it. <laughs> yeah. I still have that manuscript too, that I wrote. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I thought he was going to take it, but he didn't, you know, you go to the music store and buy that man. <laughs> Yay, college! Well, that's, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that sums it up right there for you, doesn't it? <laughs> mm, pretty much. <laughs> so after school, then what? What happens to nervous? Well, you're not even nervous, Neil. Yet you're still Neil. Yeah, I was nervous, but I wasn't claiming the name. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I wasn't qualified to do a jazz gig, clearly. Um, so for the longest time, the only um, gigs that I knew how to do were blues gigs. So I'd go to blues jam sessions. Um, after w there was nothing I could, I didn't have a degree, and even if I had, there was nothing I could do with it. Um, so the first thing I did was I moved in with my my younger brother and hi Todd moved in with my younger brother in Peoria. He was working for Caterpillar, and um, I didn't have anywhere to go. And he said, "Well, why don't you come and hang out with me until you get on your feet?" So that's what I did. And I got a job working at the mall at Musicland, selling records, tapes, records and tapes, CDs. This was 1985. We didn't have CDs in the store yet. I don't think we did. Um, records and tapes. And I was the assistant manager. Um, mm -hmm. And that was in Peoria. And I would go to Peoria Heights at a place called Duff's Rooftop, I think. And they had blues jams. And I would go to those. Um, almost every week. I was, I think I was the only saxophone player that was showing up and there were a lot of cool, rather really good players there. Dave, Dave Chastain and um, all of Coco Taylor's guitarists would show up there. Usually Maestro Saunders played, um, played for Coco Taylor and he would show up at those on a regular basis. And so I, I was doing these probably for a couple months and then um this guy comes in and he's, he's tall and he's really good looking. He's wearing a hat, like a wide brimmed hat. And everybody's like, Oh man, that's Bernard. Um, he's, he's going to want to get up here and play it. He was quiet too. So he was kind of, there was this air about him, you know? Hmm. Um, and so he comes up and um, he gets up on the stage with his guitar and everything. And I was, I was going to leave like everybody else. It's like, well, this, okay, this guy's taking over. He goes, Hey, sax man, stay up here. It's like, Oh, Okay. Um, so it was Bernard Allison, son of Luther Allison, who recorded for Motown. Yeah. But Bernard Bernard played for Coco Taylor for quite a while. And Bernard was friends with Stevie Ray Vaughan. That's where he got the hat. Um, and so I got up there and everything's in the key of E. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I was pretty good at playing by ear by that point, even though I didn't know any jazz tunes. Um, so I was pretty good at playing by ear so I could I could play in the key of E, no problem. Um, and he liked what I was doing. He said, Hey, I'm going to put a tour together and going up to, um, Canada to, to do six weeks and play up there. So I could like to have a saxophone player. Like, yeah. Mm. So that kind of happened. No. So, but yeah, it was all blues bands for until the early nineties. When so you six years, uh, started doing those jam sessions had you been listening, um, let's see how I phrase this, like in college, I'm sure you were influenced by some certain type of music, but somewhere along the line then it had to have gotten switched to where you were able to sound like a blues player or whatever they were doing, you know, for them to appreciate it. You obviously 
you weren't doing giant steps for them, but somehow you were doing more feel for them. So was there certain guys you were listening to that you had been influenced by this time now? See, I was never told who to listen to either by this professor. Um, <laughs> so I, I would try to pick up things because I, I figured I was supposed to know these things going in. And I figured that it was my fault for not coming into college prepared. I didn't know. Um, so I, I blamed myself first because that's my default mode. So I would try to pick up things from people's conversations. There was, there was one time, um, it was when I was a freshman, and Jack Waltrip, the lead tenor player that played with Miles Davis, had to stand up and do a solo. And this was like a shuffle blues thing. It was like a 12-bar blues. And ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching. It was all about feel. So Jack Waltrip stands up, and he's going to do a solo over this, and he's just busting chops, just patterns and playing like Coltrane mm -hmm. and everything. And Professor Boyd is – Professor, my pro saxophone professor was also the director of the jazz band. It's the same guy. So Professor Boyd just yeah. cuts off the band, and he's, he's, talking to, he's talking to Jack, and he's going, it's like, man – you got to change your style up, man. This is more like a shuffle blues thing. You're playing too much. You know, it's like, you know, more feel and less, less chops kind of thing. So then he started it up again and, and Waltrip stands up and he does the same kind of the same thing. And um, professor boy just cuts it off again. And he goes, this, it's like, man, I want you to play like King Curtis. You know, you talked about this. And I thought King Curtis, there's a name I need to remember. So, Waltrip never got the style down, but he didn't hand the solo off to anybody else. <laughs> as soon as the rehearsal is done, I'm thinking King Curtis, King Curtis, King Curtis. I didn't want to forget it. I went to the record store and I flipped through all the records until I found a King Curtis record and I bought it. It was the best of King Curtis volume two or something. That changed everything. King Curtis, mm -hmm. for people who don't know who he is, was a tenor saxophone player, but he mostly played with rhythm and blues bands. He was Aretha Franklin's music director in the 60s. So he played the saxophone solo on Respect. And in the 1950s, he was with the Coasters. So the song Yakety Yak, Don't Talk Back, with that really choppy, chicken-like saxophone solo, that was King Curtis. Um, I'm trying to think. He, he had a lot of solo stuff, too. Um, really, really good soulful rhythm and blues player. And so that he was pretty much my main influence. At that same record store, I found another album. I would just flip through it, and I was buying albums based on if the cover looked cool or if I liked the title, because I didn't, I didn't have anything to go on. Was the other album that I bought, I made a lot of mistakes because of that, too. I bought a lot of stuff that looked cool and you know, didn't sound good. The other one that I bought stri strictly for the title was by a guy named Ben Webster. I didn't know who he was, but he'd played with Count Bate. Was it Basie? Uh, Duke. Webster was, he was with Duke. He did Cottontail, right. He was with Duke Ellington. Okay. Um, and this was an album that he did long past his prime. Um, he had expatriated and moved to Copenhagen and recorded for a label called Black Lion. Alfred Lyon was a British jazz promoter who realized that a lot of these um, black American jazz musicians from the old school before bebop were moving to copenhagen where they still had an audience and could still indulge in their vices legally and could still be respected as african americans you know and not be beat up by the cops and all that kind of stuff so they, they were moving to copenhagen and he set up a record label to record these guys don bias and dexter gordon and ben webster and all these guys really good recordings and he was a good recording engineer and at that time ben webster had put out an album called atmosphere for lovers and thieves and I thought that was the coolest title. And I thought, if this music lives up to that title, I'm, I'm in. And I listened to it, and it's like, yep, exactly. Ben Webster's really breathy. And like, ugh, his version of Stardust to this day is one of my favorites. Um, yeah. So that and King Curtis. And there was another album that I found a couple years later by the Baxters. And it was like an old R&B revival thing when nobody else was doing that. So that's that was basically my education for getting ready for blues bands, but it was trial and error, and you know, figuring out what worked and what didn't, and making yeah. a lot of mistakes, and trying to get right on the gig. Yeah, yeah I remember I used to tell my students like, "Don't be scared to make a mistake, because you're going to make a ton of them." Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's so hard for everyone to, because we want to play it right, but 
it seems I'm not saying the only way you learn is through failing, but like you have to make these mistakes to figure it out, you know, these things when you get on there because you don't know what to expect or, you know, these things. So, yeah, it's definitely part of the process. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've got some of those Black Lion records to, or uh, CDs with Webster and Gordon. They're, they're just fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. so well recorded. And these guys had nothing to lose. And they were in a space where they felt like they were appreciated. Mm-hmm. I think the audiences in, in, in Denmark were probably a lot better than they had been in the United States. These guys were considered washed up because everybody was listening to, you know, the hot new players and, you know, by the fifties and sixties, when these guys were recording that stuff, everybody turned their attention to John Coltrane and, um, you know, the younger players and these guys were old school. Yeah. Uh, Now it's, now it's considered classic, but at the time it was considered dated. Nobody wanted to, you know, who's talking about Ben Webster in 1964, you know, you should be listening. You should be listening to Eric Dolphy. (laughs) <laughs> a good player but completely different style but ben webster man yeah well i think you, you hit on a good point there like even for younger players anybody you know any type of musician is um you know you heard that name mentioned and that made you go to the record store for the king curtis and you know that led to discovering this and discovering that you know mm. and you know, I think that's always a good thing for younger musicians to realize, you know, when you hear these older guys, if they mention a name you're not familiar with, don't just brush it off, you know, go after it, you know, find something about it, you know, and especially today, like, like you were saying, back then you had to buy the album. Well, today we got YouTube and we've got all these things to where you can at least try it out for, and not have to pay for it. You know, back, back then we were going broke trying to figure out. Yeah, um, literally, you know. I've got three dollars now. What am I going to spend it on? You know, <laughs> which, which one am I taking a chance on? <laughs> you can get a Happy Meal, or you can get a Ben Webster album. See, I would, I would always look at it that way. Not Happy Meal, but I would always look at it that way too. It's like I can eat food, but that's you know that's going to last for twelve hours. <laughs> yeah. um, or I can buy this album that might have an influence on me for the rest of my, you know. So. I was the same way. Yeah, that's crazy. When my friends and I would go out, uh, you know, when we were late teens, early twenties, and it was legal to drink in Iowa at nineteen, uh, you know, I'd still go out with my friends, but I'd be, I'd, I'd always think, ten dollars, I could buy ten used records at the record store, and if I drink tonight, that's just gone, you know, before the night's over, you know. <laughs> but the albums are. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, that's true about about beer. You don't buy beer; you just rent it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's coming and going. <laughs> <laughs> and not that I didn't, you know, indulge with my friends, but it was like it made me not, you know, for for those that wanted to spend twenty or thirty dollars, I was, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not going. Yeah. That. It was more thinking about tomorrow. I'm heading over to the record, the used record store, and see what gems I can find or laughable things but you know like you said it was yeah. a, more of an investment you know you're thinking about yeah I, did, I didn't even have a turntable or a stereo system at the time when i was a freshman i had nothing so i would i would if i bought a record i would go to the listening library at the university uh at the university library and um they had booths up there and you could you know you could sign in to to use a turntable or a turntable with a real open real deck or a turntable with a cassette deck and you could make copies. So I had, I had some kind of a Walkman thing that I'd acquired somewhere along the way. And so that's what I would do. I would record everything onto cassette and listen to it that way. By the time I was a sophomore, I had the same roommate for the last three years of college. Um, and he was a neighbor, lived on a you know, farm about two miles away from me when I was growing up. And he had a really nice stereo and he would let me play records. Mm, nice oh that was nice yeah <laughs> yeah i find it interesting because that process still goes on like i get these um, vintage guitar magazines monthly and so they have reviews in them or they'll have articles with somebody i don't know and and the thing i automatically do is then i go and start researching you know who are these guys and yeah listen, you know, where you can find it youtube or whatever you know some streaming service or something 
So it's never changed since high school. You know, that, that process still goes on to this yep. day. <laughs> and yep. you know, discovering people and finding out, oh, I like this or something like that. You know, something I never would have come across on my own, but something's yeah. mentioned. You know, so it's, it's a lifelong love affair in a sense. <laughs> It's easier to to discover things now, though, because there's so much information, and um, it's it's easier to find things. Yes, mm-hmm. and you can listen to it before you make the purchase, which is nice. Yes, definitely. So, all right, Neil. So you uh, you're doing the jam sessions. This this guy comes in and he likes you, and so what what begins to happen? Or he likes your playing, you know, type of thing. And you're playing in E, which isn't simple for a sax player, but uh, you're doing it well, I'm imagining. I figured out a hack, and I teach this to my yeah. students. Um, well, you might as well know this, too. <laughs> so you're a guitarist, and you're playing in the key of E. E is an easy key for the guitar because your top and your bottom strings are both E when they're open. Yep. So it's an easy easy chord to form, and I think that's why guitarists usually default to that key, E, A, B, those keys. As a tenor saxophone player we have to transpose everything. So everything is bumped up a step. So when you're playing in the key of E, which is four sharps, a tenor saxophone is playing in the key of F sharp, which is six sharps. An alto sax would be playing in seven sharps, which is the maximum number of sharps that you can have. C sharp, that's what's going on. Um, And because I wasn't asked to learn scales in college, I didn't know the F sharp scale, you know. But without really knowing what I was doing, um, I realized that instead of playing, I knew the theory, um, instead of playing six sharps, to make it sound bluesy, I would play on the parallel minor, F sharp minor instead of F sharp major. That gets rid of three sharps right off the bat. And if you use the pentatonic scale, that eliminates another sharp. So yeah. the F sharp minor pentatonic scale, which sounds really bluesy, only has two sharps in it instead of six. So I would spend all of my time improvising on minor pentatonic scales in those keys. That's okay. all I knew. That is honestly all I knew. And I had to rely on my ear for everything. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's a good thing that you figured out there. I was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got really lucky. <laughs> but I mean, but that key is so prevalent. Yeah. That, you know, if you don't figure it out, you're just doomed. Yeah. If you're working it, with guitar players. Yeah, when well, people hear saxophone players or a trumpet player, and, and we'll say tenor sax, first of all. Tenor and soprano, yeah. They don't realize that, that a gu- guitar and a piano are in one key, and you guys are a step up. And yeah. so you're either, half, I mean, you're having to transpose, but either you have the music there and you're transposing off a C, quote unquote, C instrument chart. Mm-hmm. But even improvising, you're having to think differently. So you, you're never in this. So a key of C for us with no sharps, no flats is D for you, which is yep. two sharp. But like you said, when we get into E, that might be four sharps for us. But now all of a sudden it turns into F sharp for you guys. And that's why I mentioned earlier, a lot of people don't like to play in those keys, horn players anyway, not all of them, but some of them would rather uh, especially like with the jazz standard, if we were in E, they might ask you to go down to E flat. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's how that's how I started. So that's kind of my comfort zone. Yeah. Those those keys. And so the, when a jazz a jazz player wants to put you in E flat, it's like, because that's F. Now that's it, a flat. And it's like, oh, now I got if I'm going to do blue notes, now I got the flat that's in the key signature plus three, you know, potentially three more flat third flat fifth flat seventh yeah yeah because i remember that when i first started doing gigs with you many many years ago we were doing some song and i asked like you know do you want to change the key it was probably some jazz standard and you were like no i'm fine and and then you told me the story of what you had done what i'd been through yeah that's kind of how you had been raised or paid your dues, so to speak, of <laughs> having to play an E and all those A and, and those type of things. Yeah, I paid so, my dues with Bernard. <laughs> my guy. Let's hear, let's hear that story now. Because is, is that what comes up next uh, now? Is that Bernard 
Bernard does it have to <laughs> come into your life? <laughs> Yeah, he's he's still he's based in Minneapolis or Minnesota, Minneapolis, I think. Min, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I think he's somewhere in Minnesota. I think it's Minneapolis. And he's still playing. He's two years younger than me, I think. Still putting out albums. And it, it looks like he jumps labels every time he puts out something new. I, I think he doesn't want to sign contracts. Um but man, I don't know. So <laughs> The, the band was based in, in Peoria, Bernard, Bernard's band. And around that time, I'd moved up to the Quad Cities, like during the same time that I've, I've, I've met Bernard, I've agreed to be in his band. And then, you know, within a couple of months, I'm, I'm rehearsing with him, but then I've moved to the Quad Cities. So now I'm driving down to Peoria for rehearsals. <clears throat> yes. And so these guys are all friends of Bernard's, you know, he'd known these guys, went to high school with them in Peoria or something like that. Um, uh, Frank and Ray Alexander. And, um, I don't remember who the other player was. Um, so then the tour is in, in starts in January of Ontario. So in the middle of winter, we're, you know, several degrees latitude up North and, um, Bernard had lost his driver's license for one reason or another. And so he wanted me to come down to Peoria. I'm going to pick him up and then we're going to drive toward the gig. So I thought, okay. And I didn't want to ask a lot of questions because he was quiet and, you know, he had this, he had this blues heritage. And I thought, it's like, just keep a low profile. I felt like I was lucky to be in the band. I was the only white guy in the band when it started, when we were rehearsing. So, um, and I just thought, I, I really don't deserve to be here. I got to make the best of this. And I got to keep my mouth shut, keep my ears open and, and do a good job. So I had quit my retail job to go on the road with Bernard. He told me he was going to pay me 200 bucks a week. So it's like, okay, I didn't get anything in writing. Um, quit my job. And so now I'm driving to Peoria, picking up Bernard. Bernard's in the passenger seat and we're driving. He said, uh, we need to go to Chicago. I'm like, okay, we're going to Chicago. I didn't think anything of it because we're supposed to be headed for Detroit. And then uh, London, Ontario was the first gig. We had two weeks at a club there. And so we're driving to Chicago and he's really quiet. He's just like watching the scenery go by and everything. And I got up the nerve to ask him, you know, this is on a Thursday. The gig starts on Monday, two weeks at the fire hall in London, Ontario. And I said, so are the other guys going to meet us up there or, you know, are we going to rehearse? Or, you know, what's going on? And he goes, no, they ain't coming. <laughs> so gotta be a joke, right? <laughs> we're heading toward a gig and it's me and Bernard and there's no band. Okay. So that's clearly, that's a joke. I quit my band. He's trying to, you know, so I asked him again, I rephrased it. And I said, uh, so, you know, when we get there, those guys, are they going to be there already? Or are they coming later? He goes, no, they ain't I told you they ain't coming. So I was like, uh, okay, well, what's happening? And he, and then he tells me the story. It was the two brothers. It was Ray and Frank Alexander. I can't remember which one, but one of them had broke their wrist in a bar fight. <laughs> Must have been the drummer. I don't, I don't know. And they worked as a team. They were pretty close. They worked as a team and one wouldn't go without the other. So you got a musician with a broken wrist and the, the brother that won't go. It's like, I'm not going without my brother. And then supposedly the, the rhythm guitarist hears this and it's like, well, it sounds like you don't have much of a band staying, staying behind. I got things to do. So Bernard's telling me this, and it's like, I quit my job. <laughs> I'm starting to like, wait, what? <laughs> He's like, I quit my job. It's like, oh, man, it's like, what are we going to do? And, he, and the first thing he said is, is, it's just the blues, man. It's just the blues. We'll pick up players along the way. And now that makes sense to me. Of course, pff, three chords and everything's in the key of E. What's, what's the problem? <laughs> you can learn that in one rehearsal. So... You know, he's trying to tell me that. I'm starting to freak out and I'm driving. I'm trying not to cry. Um, and so then he starts reading me. He's like, it's like, ah, oh, I should have known better. <laughs> should have known better. And I thought, oh, crap, I just blew it. You know, it's like, you know, he took a chance on me, kind of an unknown and, you know, took a chance on me. And now he's, he's like having second thoughts. It's like, oh, man. 
So I'm trying to keep my composure. And he's going, it's like, we're going to Chicago to pick up a bass player. Noel Neal, Kenny Neal's brother. Really good bass player. And, um, <clears throat> and so then he starts, he's like, he's reading me. He's like, I should have known better. And he's like, I, got, I don't know why you're so anxious. And he's, you know, coming up with all these adjectives from, from my anxiety. And um, he finally, finally lands on, you know, I don't know why you're so nervous, nervous Neil. And he, so he's going on like that. And um, it's like, yeah, nervous Neil. That's what you are. You know? <laughs> it's like looking out the window, watching the scenery going by and I'm driving. <laughs> um, nervous Neil. It's like, no, I'm just going to call you nervous because you ain't nothing but nervous. Like, well, okay. Okay. And we picked up a bass player in Chicago. Um, there was... Uh, bass play uh, no bass player was from chicago a drummer and a rhythm guitarist from one was from kitchener and one was from ottawa ontario that bernard knew these guys and they knew his stuff um we had one rehearsal and they knew the tunes clearly they knew what was going on and it's like oh okay i should not have been nervous and everything went fine um, but on stage, you know, I'm thinking this is going to be my big break because I'm playing with this guy and he knows Stevie Ray Vaughan, they're friends. And there was some talk that we were going to open an, an East Coast leg of the tour of Stevie Ray Vaughan's tour. We were going to be the opening act. But Bernard was hesitant to work with white management, so it didn't happen. Um, he didn't want to sign a contract, you know. I, I'm sure Coco Taylor was, was like that, too. Um, she didn't – she was distrustful. She'd probably been ripped off by – I don't know. Was she with Chess Records or something like that? She probably signed a recording contract where they they just ripped her off. So that's understandable. Um, but there was some talk about that kind of thing. But every night on stage, if he introduced me, when he introduced me, on the saxophone, nervous. And I just <laughs> thought, I was like, man, really? I didn't say anything. But And the next band I played with after Bernard... Um, was Rock and Billy and the Rhythm Riot. And they knew Bernard. Everybody in Peoria knew Bernard's. And, and they knew that he called me nervous. And so they called me nervous too. And I thought, oh, just own it. And it turns <laughs> out that there was, there was this really cool song called Nervous Man Nervous, which is about, you know, in the 50s, nervous was, was considered kind of a cool quirk. And uh, so I kind of, you know, I thought, oh, okay, Nervous Man Nervous. Okay, nervous is like, you know, like bad is good, Huey Lewis. <laughs> or, you know, sick is a good is a compliment yeah. that's a sick solo man oh thank you so nervous you know it was kind of so nervous neil and when you have a name like neil smith you gotta spice it up somewhere <laughs> there are a lot of other neil smiths spelled the same way in the music business too there's a drummer for alice cooper he's neil smith there's a younger jazz drummer from kansas city neil smith um and there's there's another one too there's a state senator from iowa the Neil yeah, Smith, you know, Neil Smith refuge. Wildlife Refuge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, nervous, Neil. I guess it's it makes sense. It's that's what I got. That's what I got. It, how long did that gig last? Six weeks. At at the end of six weeks, and we wound up in Ottawa, which is all the way up by Quebec, and kind of far. Well, it seemed far north to me, and and fairly far east in Canada. So we just kept moving north and east. We, we did London Kitchener. I'm not going to remember all these. And there were, there were a couple other cities I, that I don't remember. I've got it written down somewhere. But we wound up in Ottawa at the Rainbow Room, which was not a gay club. Rainbow Room. It was a blues club. Maybe it was a gay blues. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> the Rainbow Room. And uh, so that was our last engagement. I think we were there for a week. And then to get back home, um, I had left my car in Chicago. I don't remember how this was, but for some reason, I, my car was in Chicago. I had, I had left it there. And I don't remember now how we got from Chicago to Detroit and then Detroit to, there was some other transportation. I honestly, we, we may have taken a bus from Chicago to Detroit. I don't know, but then I don't know how we got to... I wish I knew. I didn't take notes. But anyway, my car was parked in Chicago. And so I needed to get a bus from Ottawa, Ontario to Chicago. It was a 16-hour bus ride. And Bernard told me after the last gig, he said, I'll meet you at the bus station and I'll pay your fare. And I thought, cool. 
So I was there. I was there in plenty of time, and the bus is about ready to leave, and there's no sign of Bernard. And I yeah. thought, well, there's probably some girl made him late or something like that. He liked the ladies, still does, <laughs> I'm sure. So I waited for the next bus, and he still didn't show up. And I just thought, okay, all right. I took that bus. <laughs> <laughs> Never saw Bernard again. Oh, the other thing was Bernard told me he was going to pay me 200 bucks a week. Yeah. And he did. He did <laughs> in Canadian funds, which at the time was about 62 cents on the dollar. Oh, no. Yeah. But he did. He paid me. Paid me in Canadian money. <laughs> <laughs> I came home with next to nothing. I Yeah. Because we had to buy our own food and everything. And what what was that you came home with a nickname came home with a nick yeah a nickname <laughs> a nickname and i paid a little bit of dues just a little yeah. bit yeah so after that gig uh ends then you you mentioned uh playing with a band in peoria was that a long-term yep. thing yeah, so that that must have been like 1980, the rest of 1987, 88, 89, probably into 1990. That was a couple of years. And we we toured a lot. We were trying to get sponsored by um, Miller Beer. Mm. Um, and that band, we did some original music. It was a shuffle blues band, Rock and Billy and the Rhythm Riot. Um, and we played regionally, like Peoria, um, Champagne. We never went to Chicago. Um, the Quad Cities, Clinton, uh, Clinton, Iowa. Um, played at Kelly's Old Irish Mint up there. Played at Macomb quite a bit. Um, lots of college parties. Um, and it was fun. It was fun. And um, I was the only horn player. And um, so I could write my own horn parts. And so when somebody was singing, I, I didn't want to just stand there. And so I, I, would, I would play a line that didn't get in the way of anything and try to blend in with the rhythm section. That was a good thing to be able to do. Yeah. Um, and we toured, we went to, uh, at one point we went to some ski resorts, um, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, Winter Park, Colorado, played at the Mangy Moose, um, did a couple of those. That was when, that was later when we were trying to get sponsored by Miller Lite. We also, um, we got in this big box van and we went down to Key West, Florida and played at Margaritaville, Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville. That was usually like a week long engagement. Um, it might've been two weeks. We played there, we played Jackson, Mississippi, played at some clubs in Pinellas Park, Florida. Um, that didn't happen, it was usually regional stuff around here. Um, and every once in a while we'd go on these tours so those were interesting. Yeah. So that's what, like three years you said, maybe three, three to yeah. four years. Yeah. And I had, um, I had a regular job too at the time. I was still working retail for music land. Okay. Um, different stores, you know, but yep. <laughs> so after that, um, you get through that and then what, what happens with, now the nervous Neil Smith. <laughs> well, I, w I was living in, living in the Quad Cities and, you know, driving back and forth to Peoria to, to play with Rock and Billy and those guys and to do rehearsals and all that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. you, 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 you moved up they were a Peoria-based band. Then. And I was, I was living in Moline in the, you know, late 80s, early 90s. And um, I lived in this house in Moline that was near where the Stardust Hotel used to be, Stardust Mot Hotel, by, right by the interstate. And um, mm -hmm. there was a piano player that, that played in their lounge on a regular basis, this guy named David Holcomb. And somebody told me, it's like, you need to check that guy out. He's really good and he's entertaining. So I went and, um, you know, sat at the piano and everything is like, you know, he's doing all of his classic jokes and everything. Is there anything you want to hear in the worst way? Because I'm just the guy to do it. That kind of thing. And I thought, this guy, <laughs> he's a good piano player and he's got a sense of humor. Um, and... I told him that I was a saxophone player and lived a couple blocks away. And at that time he was directing the jazz band at St. Ambrose because they didn't have anybody else to do it. And there were like two or three Ambrose students that were in the band and everybody else was a ringer <laughs> and he didn't have anybody to play lead alto. 
So he told me that there was a school horn that I could use and I could play lead alto. And so I played lead alto for that school year with Holcomb directing. Uh, the drummer's name was Dave Salins. And the, I think the Van Spirebrooks might have been students there, but they were in the band. I don't know if they were students. Um, and I'm trying to think of who else was in it. I, don't, I really don't remember. Van Spirebrooks would have been there like 85, 86 to okay. 90, 90. So they were, they were ringers too. They would have been ringers too. Okay. Um, and I, I really didn't know anything. I didn't have any connections up here or anything. I was just trying to trying to figure something out. I didn't know where the jam sessions were or anything. And Dave Salins was talking to somebody. I think he was talking to Dave Holcomb. Um, he goes, "Yeah, the gambling boats are coming to town. They're hiring live musicians. They're going to have auditions." And so I'm, you know, like I normally do. I'm keeping my ears open and keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> Unlike right now. <laughs> and so I, I learned through that conversation by overhearing that conversation that gambling boats were going to be hiring live musicians. So I auditioned and I got the gig. I think that's where I met you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and waiting. that honestly, I, I didn't know any jazz until I started doing that gig. One of the gigs that I, I think I was doing. <sighs> It seems to my mind that I was doing 12 shifts a week, but that can't be right. You never know. Well, maybe they were four hour shifts, right? Yeah. When it started. Um, and one of the gigs I had, um, Matt Craighead and I were the two saxophone players and we were put together. There might've been another horn player too, but I think it was Matt and me. And he's the one that showed me, um, he showed me how to read chord changes. He was really patient. He wasn't, he didn't have the attitude. It was like, why, how did you get this gig? If you can't even, if you don't know what you're doing, he had a fake book and, and he would show me, it's like, here's, here's what this means. And this is a turnaround. So you can just, you know, those three chords are linked and it's this tonality. And he, he kind of told me that stuff and I was able to, I'd always let him take the first solo so I could get a feel for it. If I didn't know the song, that's how I learned jazz standards, started to learn jazz standards was on wow. that gig interesting and that was a full-time that was full-time playing gig if you wanted it was it that way for you too uh when i first got on it was i only had the one shift mike bloomy got me on to play bass yeah and that it was you and matt craighead and, and joel dick were in the band on that shift was that so when i was playing with with matt craighead you were on that gig yep not initially it, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't remember that, but <laughs> the reason I don't is because I was so terrified about getting through the gig. Um, I only remember a couple other things about that entire nine month period um, and that gig. Um, but we were, we were up front. We were at the edge of that yep. semicircle stage. And so we were right in front of the poker table, the blackjack tables. And um, we would get these looks, you know, like if, if we're, if our volume got a little bit too much, you know, we'd get these looks. It's like, hey, tone it down. We're trying to deal cards here. <laughs> so I was always conscious of that. And I was less aware of what was going on behind behind us, behind Matt and me. And, the, you know, he was explaining the chord changes to me and everything. It's like, oh, okay, I'll try to get through this. I, at the time, I was, I was using a little bit of that info to get through it, but really still relying on my ear. Because mm. that's really, that's what I had. And... You know, that's not a talent. That's just something you develop if if that's all you got. Yeah. Um, yep. That's interesting because by the time I was playing with you on that shift, you seemed like a pro by that time. I was I winging was, it, dude. I was winging it the entire time. And I was new to it too. I mean, I, I could read chord changes and stuff, you know, from my past experience, but all the jazz stuff was fairly new to me. You know, I didn't yeah. know didn't know a lot of standards yet you know I could read what was put in front of me but I didn't you know you couldn't call like don't get around much anymore and I would know it by memory yet you know I, I'd need to have a you know I got the one real book and then uh eventually Holcomb I bought one off of him I think the the yellow one and uh somebody got me the middle you know the second one or whatever but it was I was in that same position with you of just you, you're trying it would, to would have been nice if you had told me that <laughs> just kind of hanging on, you know. 
I just figured everybody else knew everything and that I was, you know. That's how I, I figured was, everybody else was. I figured out, like I said, I always figure I'm the worst person on the gig. So I always. <laughs> no, that is, no, that'll be me. <laughs> so I, 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 rem, I remember that. So I, I remember Matt Craighead teaching me how to read changes and how to navigate tunes. The other two things that I kind of remember, I remember something Holcomb said too, but uh, <laughs> I, I was reading a novel by James Baldwin down in the, in, you know, where we had our breaks. Uh-huh. Down, um, yeah. Down below the waterline. And uh, I'm reading James Baldwin and, and Holcomb goes, what are you reading? It's like, uh, it's Giovanni's room by James Baldwin he goes, that guy was as queer as a $3 bill. <laughs> and I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, anything Holcomb says is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember that. No Dave Holcomb, they wouldn't get that whole thing that you just said right now, but that's typical. I mean, the way he is on a gig and he claps underneath the, the stool and, and everything, you know, the, the guy, sure. he's, he's always funny and he, he hardly ever laughs. And yes. he looks like Pat, he looks like Pat Paulson from the Smothers Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. when you a gig with him, he doesn't tell you what tune he's going to play. No, he just starts. Yeah, he just starts. And you, yep. you're already, he just you're starts. Oh, he just starts okay. playing an intro. Yeah. And then uh, sometimes he's halfway into a form. He goes, oh, that, okay, that's what he's doing. Yeah. Um, autumn, in, autumn in New York. Okay. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> and when he sings, he changes the lyrics and uh, throws different words in. and Just to see if uh, people are paying his, attention. Yeah. It is a classic. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we got it. We, somebody's got to have recordings of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Good player, though. He's a really big fan of Horace Silver. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I remember on that gig that the shift that that I had with you because, like I said, I came later and I had the shift with you and uh, Joel Dick liked my playing and so he told Matt Potchlight about me, which then led me to get yeah. more shifts because Matt was yeah. to the shifts. But when I was still just doing the one shift with you guys, I want to say it was like a eight to midnight nine to one shift it was a late like a monday night type thing if i remember but i remember around midnight or one we we would start getting bored a little and (laughs) we would do like popular tunes but we would swing them Mm. and i remember sounds about right (laughs) and i remember us doing funky town and uh yeah you know think motown songs or whatever but we would we would put it with a swing thing so the people did you know the gamblers never knew what was going on they just you know just figured it was another jazz tune right because we had we had to dress like steamboaters kind of we didn't wear panama hats but we had brocaded vests and we had string ties right yeah <laughs> and, a, and a white shirt it looked like we worked at shakey's or something <laughs> yes <laughs> your pizza's ready sir <laughs> So shortly after that, um, shortly after that, um, I had we that gig kind of started to disappear after about nine months. Um, the ship was hit with a fine. The uh, President Riverboat Casino was hit with a fine for back royalties. Um, the um, American Society for Composers and Publishers ASCAP came in. Um, did I tell you this story? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, the, but yeah. the good gig was was in the casino. That mm-hmm. was kind of, you know, because it was kind of like a it was an atmosphere. And then a couple decks up, there was this place called the Winner's Lounge, which is where you went when you lost all your money. And at the <laughs> yeah. time, at the time on these boats, the boat would have to float into the middle of the pool of the Mississippi River for for gambling to start. So it it would go out for 4 hours and then it would come back. If you know, it all the passengers would get out and they'd let on new passengers and then they'd go out in the middle of the pool. We were supposed to float up and down the river, but the, the river levels were too high and it wouldn't, the smokestacks wouldn't fit under the bridges. So we, we just go out into the middle of the pool and just sit there. Um, 
so there, when you lost all your money, there was nowhere to go. If you if you lost all your money within two hours, then you'd go up to the winner's lounge and listen to Matt Podschweit and I play, play tunes. And fortunately, he had a fake book that I could read from. <clears throat> and there was one time we were playing, and there was nobody there, but we were playing anyway. And some guy comes in. He's wearing a suit, and he's drinking a cocktail or something like that. And he's requesting some really cool tunes. It's like, I'd like to hear, um, do you know any Thelonious Monk tunes? And Matt's going to say, yeah. Yeah, we could do that. Um, so it, it got to be like that. And he's going, it's like, how about some, um, do you know any Clifford Brown? We didn't think anything of it. We just thought this guy had lost his money and he was wanted, or his wife's down there, whatever. Uh, and then we announced that Matt announces we're going to take a break. And the guy comes up to us. We think he's going to make a request. And he opens up his wallet. And there's a, some kind of an ID that identifies him as being with ASCAP, American Society of Composers and Publishers. And he goes, um, my name's this, and you know, I'm, with Ask, I'm with ASCAP, and you know, that's why I was making those requests. And Matt is just like, oh, God. <laughs> and he goes, nah, no, it's, it, you guys, there's no problem, with, no problem with you guys. You're, just, you're doing your job. You're doing what I asked you to do. You're playing the request. Everything's fine. Um, but I'm going to have to talk to somebody on the ship. Who's your supervisor? <laughs> <laughs> and it was around that time when I – I read a news headline that the the ship had been fined forty thousand dollars or something for back royalties. It was a big amount, but this was like six months in or something. And then, you know, so now the 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 gambling mode is starting to see us as a liability, and they phased us out and brought in like DJs and stuff like that. So we thought it would last forever. Around that same time, um, I was in a relationship, a marriage that that was on the rocks, um, partly because I was playing on gambling boats. Um, and so that fell apart around the same time as the, you know, you, you lose your gig on the, on the boat. Um, so there were some lean times in there where I wasn't, I wasn't gigging very much at all, um, for a couple of years. Um, and Weren't then I was in playing, I seem to remember when, when we were doing the boats, weren't you like in a 50s, 60s rock band at the time? Or was that just... Like oh, yeah. Why did you have to remind... Yeah, yeah. Because oh. I didn't know if that was like a permanent regular gig or if that was just you sitting in occasionally with... Well, I don't remember the name of the band, but... Oh, I remember, man. I remember you saying that you had a gig, you know, with 50s, All 60s. right. Thanks, Troy. <laughs> you with your... <laughs> You with your bear trap memory. <laughs> gotcha, Neil. Yeah, I don't. Honestly, no, I was not trying to avoid that issue. I honestly, that, that does, that is not a memory that sticks around. And, you know, I just, okay. There was this club in West Davenport called the Rusty Nail. The owner of that club was a guy named Jim. What's that guy's name? I don't uh, I'm thinking Jim Straley, Jim Stick. Now there's none of those guys. Um, but anyway, he owned the club and he played keyboard in the band. And they had the saxophone player who was really good, but um, he had vertigo, something. He he had trouble standing up and he would get dizzy really easily. Um, and he wanted to take some time away from the band. And I don't remember how they find out, found out about me. Um. But anyway, they had me audition. It was a 50s and 60s rock band called Pink Cadillac, and we wore pink tuxedos because <clears throat> these pink tuxedos were like being given away by some tuxedo rental shop. I go, oh, we'll have these, and we'll call ourselves Pink Cadillac. But yeah, it was a 50s, 60s rock band. Um, yeah, and that was back when people could, people could smoke in bars, and you could see the smoke would just hang there. Yeah. Oh, it was horrid. It was horrid. And it was one of those bands where, you know, they're playing the songs correctly, but, you know, we do the song Pink Cadillac, Pink Cadillac, Plush Velvet Seas, right in the back. No energy. No energy at all. Just get through the motions and keep the dancers on the dance floor. I'll, they only care about the drummer. Just dismal. Was it because just playing the tunes over and over, everyone was bored? or? No, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I remember at first it's like I, you know, maybe it's my, maybe my job is to inject some energy into this. So I, I try to, you know, every time I got a solo, I try to like rip, you know, it's like, rah, rah. I realized I was just wasting my energy and, and the guys in the band didn't care and the audience didn't care. Oh, you know, oh man, just, that's, 
that's sad. Disheartening. But I think, and I don't remember that gig very much, but it was a regular gig because it was Jim Sturgis. Jim Sturgis oh. owned the Rusty Nail, and he was the keyboard player. And Tom Poplar was in it. He played guitar and sang. Mike Frank, I think, was in it. Do you know Mike? I don't know Mike. Uh -uh. Okay. And I'm trying to remember the drummer's name, and it's I, – I was one of the younger members, and the drummer was pretty young too, um, and he was kind of cool, but he didn't say much. Um, was, uh, was George Smith the sax before you, or was that a different band? No, it wasn't George. Okay. Um, I wish I could remember his name because he was a really cool guy, and he was really, really nice to me and everything. He was an older black dude, and – I don't remember his name and I wish I did um, because he, I mean, he gave me a list of songs I needed to know in the keys and um, you know. Oh, nice. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, he was, he was really cool. He wasn't was like, yeah, you're taking my gig. Um, yeah. I, I think he was kind of grateful. You know, it, it, after talking to him, I felt like I was doing him a favor. I wasn't taking his gig. I was doing him a favor. It was the way, that's the way it seemed. And it seems to me that shortly after, like within a year, he, he had passed away or he'd gotten really sick. Oh, no. Yeah. And I, I really wish I knew who he was. Um, I'm not even sure that he was from Davenport. I don't okay. know. I wish I knew. Um, yeah, he was I, a really, really good player, too. I just seem to remember, like, after, you know, when I had more shifts on the boat, if I played with you on a Friday, let's say, during the day, I remember you mentioning you'd have a gig at night, and I remember it being with, like, a 50s, 60s band, but I, I couldn't remember what band that was. Yeah, um, you're better off not remembering. I'm going to go back to not remembering that gig now. <laughs> the, only, the only remnant I have of that is I, I kept – we had pink glitter – cummerbunds sparkly cummerbunds and pink glitter ties bow ties and then we oh. had to everybody had their own tuck shirt and it was a pink jacket and black pants that was our uniform i wish i, I was making that up uh, no, i remember uh, that winner's lounge i was playing with uh and dave holcomb we were playing in the yeah. lounge and that's when we, where I was when I got the news that all the shifts were going to be ending. Josh Duffy just showed up at my window. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? I'm streaming, dude. <laughs> I'm streaming. I hope he has a mask. He, he does. He has a mask. <laughs> like during the same time that I, I, I remember not... You see Josh? There he is. He's, he's doing an 80s dance. That's hilarious. <laughs> All right. I, I, I think he just got through streaming, too. I think he was doing it's Bix's, uh, the anniversary of Big Spider Bix. Yeah, I saw that. Or, yeah. Well, do we need to end this so you can go talk to Josh? Or? No, he left something at the door. I'm not sure that I want to know what it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I can I can I can tell by the lighting that it's not a flaming bag of poop. <laughs> but I wouldn't put it past him. So so you just have back celebrities just drop by the house at any time. Celebrities <laughs> drop by the house all the time. Yes, they do. <laughs> yeah. I had a celebrity phone call from Manny Lopez. Manny Lopez, the second junior. Oh. Um earlier today he called to check in to make sure i was doing okay and to see if i needed anything <laughs> yeah. yeah that's good because it's, it's time for me to call him too I, I always call him once every two or three weeks to make sure he's not yeah it's good to, just, good to check up oh, on people that live alone yeah i make sure he's not sitting in the living room somewhere alone you know <laughs> and hasn't yeah. had any <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh. So you move on from the uh, the Pink Cadillac band, and you Pink Cadillac. Uh, there, there were some lean years there. I think um, you and I were doing playing at Orwell's and Cheers and places like that for a while, on and off. Rascals, Rascals. I was doing gigs with Joel, jazz gigs with Joel, and Larry Huntley. Gary Gibson was in there somewhere. Um, but I mean, it wasn't. A, you know, you, you would have to have a, um, a day job. It wasn't something yeah. you could live off of. 
And um, the only job that I could get was at a, uh, an old fashioned print shop in Muscatine. And so I worked there for a while. Um, and it was around that time, I think, I had gone into a restaurant called, or a, a health food store called Greatest Grains that was owned by Clyde and Julie Mayfield. Clyde just passed away yesterday. Clyde Mayfield. He was um, about 10 years older than me, but he, he had been one of my students at one time. Um, he's like one of the civil rights leaders of the Quad Cities, like back in the day. It was really yeah, I saw that in the news. Yeah, I saw yeah. that Yeah, he just passed away. Um, but I was in Greatest Grains, and there was a an ad on the bulletin board for um, somebody wanting to put together a killer polka band, which did get my attention, really. But <clears throat> this this guy that had put the poster up had listed these influences. It's like, it's it's not just polkas. I want the music to be influenced by Raymond Scott. And um, oh, I still have the and, – um, and the Ramones. I mean, it was just this weird, diverse – list of of bands that didn't have anything in common raymond scott the ramones um what else did he, like claude debussy and i was like what it's like i, I don't want to play in a polka band but i have to meet this guy this who is this so i answered the ad i was one of two people that answered the ad the other guy played tabla um i used to know who he was i don't remember his name uh, he didn't really fit in. He only showed up to one one get together, and then we never saw him again. So it's these two accordion players and me. And I thought this band is never going to get a gig because who's going to hire two accordions and a saxophone player? And then the leader of the band starts talking about it. it's like we need we need a name. We need to start doing some gigs. And I thought, yeah, right. Um, and um, and because he started talking about doing gigs. I had this agreement with Joel, Joel Dick, um, because we had played in so many bands together um, where there's a guitarist that always just, you know, he starts at like the volume, volume four out of 10. And after two or three songs, it's like, yeah, just notch it up a little bit to like four and a half, four and three quarters. And then two or three songs later, it's like, yeah, I still need a little bit more, about five and a half or so. <laughs> and that happens just continually throughout the gig. Every three or four songs, the volume gets turned yep. up. And when you're a saxophone player standing in front of the amp, it's like, what are you doing? I can't hear myself. So, And Joel was in this band with me called Audrey and the Blue Cats. And um, we, we had this deal. It was like, okay, the next band, that Joel, the next band that you and I are going to be in together, no guitars. No guitars. I'm tired of this. And so here I am working with two accordion players and me. And I thought, they, it's like, we should get a drummer. It's like, Joel owes me a favor. He, Joel owes me. <laughs> it's like, we have this agreement. It's like, have I got the band for you, Joel? It's got no guitars in it. So I brought Joel to a rehearsal. I, I really thought he was going to slaughter me. And, you know, we get there and he's, he's like, he's not sure whether he should laugh or cry. And it's like, hey, you know, can you do a polka beat? And Joel's like, you mean like this? Boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, chick. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, you're really good. And it's like, Joel's looking at me like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so um that was the Kabbalas. And that lasted for five years. That that was a recording contract and nationwide touring and a record deal. We played it South by Southwest, huh? Pajama parties. We had pajama parties. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Every Kabbalah's gig was kind of a weird event. Um you guys deliberate. Yeah. Or at least you had a following in the in the in our area. We yeah, people either loved us or hated us, and there were a lot of people that hated us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At at first when we first started doing gigs, people thought it's like, well, that that's never gonna work because look at your lineup. And then when we started getting noticed, it's like, well, yeah, because look at your lineup. You're just a novelty band. It's like, well, which one is it? <laughs> we couldn't we couldn't win with the critics. I mean, it was just there's nothing we could do. We played a lot of Jewish music, and you know, only one of the band members was Jewish. One converted, and um, yeah, so, and I was supposed to be playing a clarinet, but it was a soprano. So, you know, it's just all kinds of things. But you know, 
I didn't join the band thinking it's like, oh yeah, I've always wanted to play klezmer music. <laughs> it's just here we go. One accordion player knew polkas, and one accordion player only knew traditional Jewish music. You know, yeah, klezmer. So that's that was the band, and so the first CD was half polkas, half klezmer. <laughs> So that nobody had to rehearse too much. Um, and then as as we got to our third CD, our third CD was almost entirely, um, well, our definition, our rewrite of Jewish music. We did some traditional yeah. Jewish tunes. and How did you get the deal, the record deal? South by Southwest. Well, and actually, I probably shouldn't talk about this. But I don't care anymore. This is 25 years ago. The the first CD that we put out was called so we'd been together, we had been together for four months with Joel before the leader of the group says, is like we're we're gonna record a CD. And I'm thinking it's like this isn't supposed to be serious. <laughs> um and I, I recommended um for the recording engineer because you know I was kind of the one, I guess, that had some connections because of the riverboats and stuff. Um and I had worked at McKay Music for a short time. And um, so I knew Scott Stuhler. And Scott Stuhler had a recording studio in the basement of McKay Music on Brady Street Hill in, in Davenport. The Mocambos recorded there. Yep. So you know Scott. But he had that recording studio down there. It did really, really good work. It was a shabby mm -hmm. looking place. Um, but he did really, he was really, really good at engineering and, and mixing and mastering and all that stuff. Really good. Um, so I recommended Scott Stuhler to, to record it. And, um, basically when we first released it, we pressed a thousand copies. I thought that's way too much. We sold through them pretty quickly. Um, we weren't signed to a label, but we got permission from a small label in Kalamazoo, Michigan to use their logo and their next consecutive catalog number and a barcode that would go with it. And they said, yeah, go ahead. We didn't sign a contract or anything. We just got permission to use their logo and the next catalog number in their series. And that was Lepitone Records in Kalamazoo. It mm -hmm. was not a record deal um, because the leader of the group thought that would make us look more legitimate. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're on a label. Um, and it worked. We got played on Dr. Demento, the Dr. Demento show. And um, he gave us a big plug and everything. He said, these guys are based out of Moline. They're on the Lepitone label and everything. That's national exposure. And then in 19, uh, I think it was early March of 1996, we sent a demo to South by Southwest, which is one of the biggest um, conventions for unsigned bands in the nation. It's a big, 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 big deal. Um, and they get thousands of cassettes. It was cassettes at the time, if you're doing your own. And we sent a cassette down, and uh, they only accept 600 bands at that time. And we made it. We got put on the international stage, and we played at the Rue de Maya Coffee House in South, at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. And um, there was a guy from a label in Burbank, California, that really liked what he heard and, and offered to... Uh, to repress our first CD, Martinis and Bagels, on that on his label, Dionysus. And um, he said that we could just record whenever we wanted. We had an open-ended contract. So it was kind of nice. But that was a recording contract. They just, they weren't saying, it's like, we need a new album by this date. They kind of left it up to us to do it on our own timeline. But, and they licensed some of the tunes. Um, as far as I know, the only tunes that they were licensed, I would write two songs per CD. And the only songs that they were licensing were songs I had written. Oh, no. <laughs> maybe because, maybe, well, I, I think maybe it's because they were instrumental. I don't think it was because of any other reason. Um, but there was a song I wrote called The Coffee, Coffee Guards Co Cross, The Crossing Guards Coffee Break. Man, it shouldn't have been that difficult to say. The Crossing <laughs> Guards Coffee Break that got licensed for a film and was used on um on the fuel network for a snowboarding show a couple times oh. that i know of because i didn't i didn't find it out directly from the label i found it out through the leader of the band so i don't really know what was going on so <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the cabalas and then the 
the Kabbalah's lasted for five years. Our last gig was New Year's Eve, 1999. So the joke was that, you know, because everybody thought that everybody was, every, every computer was going to malfunction on January 1st, 2000, <laughs> Y2K. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody thought everything was going to shut down and the lights were going to go off and, you know. Uh, so the joke was the only thing that stopped working after Y2K was the Kabbalahs. <laughs> <laughs> but during that time, um, the Kabbalists were doing so much that the, one of the first things that happened was a, a lot of, uh, I shouldn't say that, some, some of the jazz players, there were certain jazz players that I felt stopped taking me seriously because I was in this novelty band, you know, mm. some of the, the heavier players. And I thought, I just felt kind of marginalized. Um, but then like people like David Holcomb, um, he would call me and say, I, I got a gig with the Kabbalahs. We're going to be on the road and things like that. He just finally stopped calling all together. So I was playing with the Kabbalahs for next to nothing because all that money got reinvested in coloring books and T-shirts, glow-in-the-dark T-shirts and all this, all kinds of stuff and flying out to California to mix and master recordings and things like that. It all got reinvested. So we weren't expected to make money on a gig. And Joel was doing the same because Joel was in the same boat as me, you know, giving up students and gigs to go on the road with these guys that were using their vacation time yeah. from their corporate jobs. You know, it's like, oh. and Joel was married with so, a boy. Yes. Yeah. And me, it was just me. Joel got up the nerve because Joel was in the union. He goes, we need a per diem. If we're going to be on the road, I need at least lunch money. And yeah. that, that almost broke up the band, I think. That there was contention there and mm -hmm. a lot of reluctance from from the leader of the band to give us like $15 a day for food. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder why it didn't last. <laughs> um, so was the end of it uh, planned in? The, the, the New Year's Eve gig, was that already set that that was going to be it? No, the other accordion player had, had moved to Minnesota to, to accept a, a better job offer. Okay. Because we had just released an album. We released our third CD in October of 1999. It was called Time Tunnel. And we were supposed to start touring pretty heavily to promote that. And Barry goes, it's like, I got this job in Minnesota. So he, I think he knew that the band was kind of imploding and, and he took, he took the fall for it. And I really respect him for that. Um, because I think Joel might have might have done it. It's like I can't keep doing this, and I I wanted to stop because I was living on I was living in a studio apartment on next to nothing, <laughs> it was, and those were some lean years. I mean, I was doing okay. I was eating every day, but man, <laughs> you know, when you got to cancel students for two weeks because you got to go on the road and play for free, yeah, that's tough. Yeah, and it's true what you say when when you're. Uh doing your thing as a side man on gigs if you start saying no even if you're doing something else if you start saying that too many times the gig the calls will stop yeah they will because people the people just figure oh he's got something else to do uh, mm -hmm. they're not doing it to be spiteful or anything they just think oh you know he's been busy the last two times i've called him so i'll call somebody yeah. else yeah. yep or they might just assume you're not interested anymore. But people knew about the Kabbalists because, I mean, yeah, we got a lot of attention because of what we did. Yeah, your situation but, definitely would be different with that because yeah. I remember everybody... It took, it took me a long time to recover from that. And even like five years after that band broke up, people was like, I thought you were still with the Kabbalists. It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it took a long time to recover from that. Yeah. And about the time I recovered from it, started getting really steady jazz gigs again. Um, I, I took a break and went to cruise ships for th four years. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. after, after the Kabbalahs, was there anything immediately that came up? Yeah. Um, after the Kabbalahs broke up, there was a, there was a lot of, there was a lot of animosity between the members of the band. I, I got, it's going to make me sound like. I got along with, I made it a point to get along with everybody because, you know, who doesn't love Joel? Right. And, and I got along really well with Barry and I, I could talk to Scott. Um, but the others weren't talking to each other at all. So I, I was kind of the intermediary. So if Scott had something he wanted to say to Joel, it, go, it went through me. And it's like, Hey, 
you know, hey, Joel Scott wants, you know, wants this question answered. Or So I was, that was my purpose. And because I still got along with Scott, and because of the way, you know, like I was talking about with my college stuff, it's like, oh, okay. Somebody asked me to do something. And it's like, okay, I just, you know, used to be hard for me to say no to people. So Scott put a new band together. It was called the Anachronistics. Um, and we did 20s music. And that kind of, Josh Duffy was in that, one of Joel's students, Josh, the guy at the window. Um, <laughs> because Joel didn't, he didn't want to do it. And then shortly after that, he started getting sick. Um, so Josh did that gig and it was Josh and me and Kathleen Gallagher on guitar and ukulele and Scott would play xylophone and we did twenties music. It was, it was quaint. And that lasted for maybe a year or so. And then that kind of branched off and Josh kind of formed a big band using that as the nucleus of the you know, I was in it, Scott was in it, Kathleen was in it, um, in that, in Josh's big band, this a tribute to Gene Krupa, and then that band morphed into a tribute to Gene Goldcat and was kind of like a mix feature. Um, and so the anachronistics kind of became that, but then at the same time, that same core of, of musicians became another band called the Metrolites, mm. which was just supposed to be fun. Um, nothing serious at all, and we just rehearse and have some fun and do a couple of gigs. No recordings, no anxiety, nothing. Of course, it didn't do that. We made two recordings, and then the leader of the band started licensing those recordings without anybody's permission and making money off of us. And I found out about that, and I quit. And that that was the end of everything between me and Scott. Um, and then shortly after that, um, I went to ships, cruise ships, for four years. And... And what was that like? I mean, what's what, that? What, what's, what's a gig on a on a cruise ship like? It's musical product. There's, it's, it's a gig. Um, the nice thing about working on a cruise ship is you have no expenses. Um, everything's paid for. Your food, your housing, your insurance, um, your transportation to and from. Everything's paid for. So you can, uh, and that was my goal. I wanted, I wanted to have a house of my own. So I did that for four years and saved up enough money. It's hard to get a house when you're a self-employed musician. <laughs> Banks don't want to talk to you. And if they do consider you, if they do even talk to you, it's like, well, we're going to need, you know, 40% down. And who's got that? So I worked on a cruise ship for four years, saved 90% of my income and bought a house. Yay. Um, so that's what I did. But it's... I played in the, in a, how many pieces was it? There were four horns, four horns, piano, bass, guitar, and drums. And we played in the theater every night. So people would, people would go to dinner or before dinner, they'd come to see a show and then they'd go to dinner. And then there was another, there were two shows a night. Um, and some of them were like production things. We do like a tribute to Broadway that happened every cruise and a, a Cirque du Soleil type show that happened every cruise. And we'd have these guest performers that would come on. Uh, we'd meet them at three o'clock in the afternoon. We'd go through their show, have like an hour rehearsal and then do two shows that night. So you have to be really good at reading. Um, and it was fascinating for three or four months. The first ship that I was on, um, the first itinerary was in the, the Mediterranean. And um, it was a two week cruise of Holy Land sites, like biblical sites. So we would go to Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, we went to Ephesus in Turkey um, we went to Haifa, Israel. Um, we went to some places in Greece. It was really cool. And I was fascinated. It's like, I can't believe this. My first contract was seven months. And after three months, it's like, this is insane. I can't do this anymore. And you're not even halfway through your contract. It's the same thing over and over. And the same people. <laughs> you're... <laughs> it's the same people. And it's the same, kind of the same gig. And then half of the crew doesn't like you because they, you know, the musicians would work for two or three hours a day and get $2,500 a month while there's some, you know, some young person from the Philippines that's scrubbing toilets for 12 hours a day and getting $400, $400 a month. Oh, so there's a lot of resentment. Well, it's maritime law. There's no minimum wage. Um, 
So there's a lot of resentment there. And the officers didn't like us. You know, they would always single us out for, for trainings and things like that. And it's like, show me how this lifeboat works. <laughs> and if you can't do it, they can send you home. So there's that kind of thing. Oh, wow. um, I was on the Queen Mary too. And um, this, this particular contract, when I was on it, the Commodore of the entire fleet was manning the ship. His name was Commodore Christopher Rind. And I'd spoken to him once because I did a training with him and he was writing with a fountain pen. So I, I talked to him afterwards and I said, it's like, I, I really admire the fact that you use a fountain pen. It's like, oh, do you like them as well? <laughs> and so I showed him a fountain pen that I had and he goes, this may have been a forger if you bought it at Polt. So it's like, oh, okay, this guy's a little bit. Oh, so I'm walking down the corridor in, in the crew area, you know, with my street clothes on. I'm, I'm going off to, I don't know, do some work on my computer or something like that. And Commodore Rin is walking toward me. He's, he's, wearing, he's in full uniform and everything. And he looks at me and he's going, excuse me, you're a musician. It's like, yes, sir, I am. He's, and he looks at his watch and he says, you have precisely two minutes to bring me a child's life jacket. I shall wait here. <laughs> I was like, Whoa! I knew where they were because you have to, you know, when you're a crew member, you have to be ready to go if there's a, an emergency. And I did. He was waiting there and I brought him a child's life jacket. And he says, thank you very much. Carry on. <laughs> but, you know, if I couldn't have done that, you, you get sent home. You get sent home right now. Wow. Yeah, you're off at the next port, and it's your job to get – you have to pay for your own transportation back. So it's a little bit stressful. You know, you never know when something like that's going to happen. And while I was on that ship, there was an emergency. One of the gas turbines – we were in we were in rough seas in um, – where was that? It was one of the Great Lakes. We, we were returning from Montreal, and we were headed back to New York City. And uh, it was really rough seas. The Great Lakes can be really brutal, worse than the North Atlantic because it's contained, it's like 40 foot waves. And, and the ship was really being bounced around. Um, and one of the gas turbines that was responsible for helping to ballast the ship to keep it level um, caught fire. And oh. this is um, shortly after dinner and right before our gig. And we were called to, our, I had my tux on, we were called to our emergency stations. Whoa. Yeah, it's on the Wikipedia page for the Queen Mary too. It was October of 2012. Oh. Yeah. Wow. It, it, was con it was contained really quickly, but you do not want to be on a ship that's on fire in the middle of 40-foot waves or getting in a lifeboat that's being... <laughs> yeah. No, I guess not. <laughs> yeah. I think I called my mom the next day and I said, like, if you saw the news, don't worry. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine here. <laughs> Can you tell me the story, Neil, of uh, you were telling me one time of, I think you were new to the gig and some type of siren or alarm or announcement goes off and a guy says to you something to the effect of you've got free ice cream coming. I remember that. That was on one of the celebrity ships. And one of the things that musicians could do, because musicians had the day free, pretty much, unless there was a crew drill or something or training that you had to do. We had the day off. And most of the crew didn't. Most of the crew was housekeeping and a galley crew and, you know, things like that. And they would have to work all day. And when they weren't working, they were either at the crew bar or they were sleeping because most people worked really hard on ships and the musicians didn't. We would be available during the day to do things, to work with the port and shopping guides or to work with the art gallery and bring art up from the crew area. You know, we, we could do things for some extra money. Um, so there was this trombone player named Alyssa and, and she and I were, would help the port and shopping guides. They would do presentations like, at this next port, you can go to this place to buy a Rolex. At this next port, you can, you can also go to this place to buy some, some pieces of art or some jewelry or something like that. They would need somebody to hand out maps at the entrance. And we worked in the theater, which was where the presentations happened. So we did that, and we'd get like 10 bucks an hour or something. And um, so Alyssa and I are saying that the port and shopping guys are giving their presentation about where to shop and, and where to look for certain things. And all of a sudden, there's like, ding. I can't remember what the code was. It was, 
it wasn't code. It wasn't something. It was star code. Star code. That's what it is, which is a medical emergency. Star code. Star cord. Star code. And then they would give the location on the ship, like uh, uh, port side forward, uh, deck fifteen, or something like that. So they would give the general area, and then the the medical team would go up there. And so you know, star code. Star code. And then. And Alyssa looks at me. And she's going, ooh. <laughs> and I said, why are you getting excited over Star Code? Somebody's having a medical emergency. And she goes, free ice cream. Like, what? <laughs> How does? As as it turns out, and she she had to explain this to me. She goes, I can't believe you don't know this. <laughs> if somebody passes away on a cruise ship. <laughs> they put them in refrigeration until you get to the next port. And sometimes that means that they have to clear a freezer out of food. <laughs> so free ice cream, there's free ice cream. We don't have any place to put this ice cream because we had to put a passenger in, in the freezer. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Yeah. Alyssa? I she remember. Was a she was a trombone player. So, you know, that's how they think. Yeah, when you told me that story, <laughs> It couldn't have been like two days later, I'm flipping the channels on TV and there's an episode of NCIS on. <laughs> and yeah. somebody, somebody died on the ship and they're emptying out the freezer and they're handing out ice cream. And I was like, this is what you Are said. you serious? Yes. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Yeah, I never, I never got free ice cream. I'm glad that I never got free ice cream because I like ice cream, but not if somebody has to die for it. Right. Yeah. I just, I never knew that that went on. <laughs> there, there are a lot of people, um, arguably it's less expensive to live on a cruise ship than it is to live in a retirement home, depending on, you know, like if you live in Los Angeles or something, a lot of people can't afford a retirement community. So they just cruise until they until they can't cruise anymore. Um, so, it, I mean, it, it's a fairly common thing. And a lot of these people don't leave their cabins very often. They just have room service and, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's I didn't a, know that was a thing. Isn't that sad? Yeah. That's something. So, yeah. you, so you come back from the cruise ships around what year is that now? 2013. Yep. And I've and been what? living in this, I've been living in this room ever since. <laughs> There's more to my house than just this. There's a kitchen and a, and a bathroom and a bedroom and things. But 90% of the time in the house is spent in this room. Yeah, since 2013. And I started teaching again. Um, mm -hmm. Teaching and playing. Any That's regular gig? I have had. Since I got back, you mean? Yeah. Um. Yeah, most of my regular gigs have been through Josh Duffy. There was a, he got me in at the Hotel Blackhawk right away. Um, that was, that was every Sunday for a while, for a long time, just until mid-March of this year when it got shut down. It was a buffet, a jazz brunch, and we would play every Sunday for the jazz brunch. At, at first there were horn, different horn players that would rotate, um, but then eventually it became um, a trio and it was Josh on drums and me on saxophone and then a piano player. Or, yeah, mm -hmm. or a guitarist. Sometimes they would uh, we would use uh, Ron Hillis on guitar, uh, whoever was available. Mm -hmm. um, that was a regular gig until very recently. Um, I, I don't mean any disrespect. I just I just don't remember things well. I kind of live in the have a habit of living in the moment lately. <laughs> um, I, I think there probably been some other regular gigs, and I'm just they're just not coming to mind. But nothing on the scale of the Kabbalahs or the Met or anything like that, where you know there's there's a commitment. This is the band. This lineup doesn't change. We make recordings and we tour. Not I've, I'm not doing too much of that anymore. More um, of a I kind of side man type thing, maybe more. Oh yeah, gig, yeah. Calls for gigs and yep that type of stuff. Yeah, um, I've seen what band leaders go through, and I I don't envy them. It's a lot of work, and I, I don't think I would. I don't think I would be good at it. Um, and lately, I've, I've been getting more into um, music licensing, and um, I try to take a day a week and, and try to write something or record something and and put it in a licensing library. And I've had a little bit of success with that. So that's kind of cool. Which ones have been licensed? 
Um, I wrote a song called, I called it Chaplin-esque because it sounds like it's from the 20s. Um, and I wrote it for a friend's um, YouTube channel and he decided that he didn't want to use it. Um, then I put it up on my, on my licensing page on Zoodle Music and they didn't, they didn't even upload it, so they didn't like it. And then I sent it to a collaborator of mine that lives in Boston. His name's Ryan Brady and he scored films and things like that. He's really good. Um, and he took it, polished it up, and he sent it to his licensing firm, which or the firm that he works with called Jingle Punks. And uh, within six months, it got placed on NBC Sports. It got used pretty prominently several times on NBC Sports. And then a couple other ones started trickling through too. Um, the Science Channel, Telemundo, um, Drunk History, used something on a rebroadcast. Um, sometimes I don't know what's happened until I get my royalty statement and, you know, BMI and it says it was this episode and it aired on this date and you get this much money. So it's kind of weird, but I mean, you just, you just, I just make these tunes and I put them out there and put all these descriptive terms on it. And then somebody finds quirky saxophones like, Oh yeah, let's use that. <laughs> so it, all that stuff's just out there waiting for somebody to find it. And then it gets licensed and, at a certain point, you don't really have a lot of control over it. It's just there to be used. Yeah. So you, uh, is it a certain site? I mean, there's various sites then where people can send this type of music to and then. Yeah. Usually there's, you, there's a qualifying process. Like you have to, it's kind of like a, an audition. You send them five tunes and then they go, they tell you if they want to work with you or not. Um, Cause otherwise their, their library would just get huge. Zudo music is kind of like a boutique music licensing firm. They only have 132 artists that are putting music up. Um, there's another, another one that I'm, I'm signed with is called music supervisors and they've got a huge library. That's just, it's just amazing. Um, I don't have that much on there and I don't get a lot of activity there. Um, but Ryan Brady goes through jingle punks I don't know what his process was. I tried to get in Jingle Punks on my own and they didn't respond. And I don't know what that means. Um, but I've been placed through Ryan Brady. So I don't know. Hmm. I'm not, I'm still kind of learning how it works. It's a weird business. And a lot more people are getting into it because people have really good quality recording gear in their house. And now people have lots of time on their hands. So <laughs> the market's kind of getting saturated, but if you watch a cable TV program, there's always music going on and all that stuff is being licensed through a, a licensing company like Jingle Punks or Music Supervisors or something. Yeah. So, and that, that's why I left the Metrolites because that stuff was getting licensed without the permission of anybody else in the band. He was mm -hmm. <laughs> making money off of us. <laughs> so I actually, I had to go through, um, th I had BMI research a few things uh, just to make sure that I wasn't, it's like, is this really happening? I was seeing some of my Metrolite songs being retitled. They put a new title on it so they can use it in. It's a copyright thing. So I saw some of them being retitled with weird titles. And I saw that it was through Getty Archives Pump Audio. So I contacted them and I said, how are you doing this? How are you getting this? And it's like, we have a signed contract from everybody in the band. It's like, okay, that's forged. <laughs> I didn't sign anything. And I, I, and again, I called Josh and I called Devin, you know, the other musicians in the band. I go, did you guys remember signing anything so that we could get our stuff licensed? And Devin's like, hell no, you know, and Josh doesn't really, I don't remember anything either. I didn't sign anything with that band. So then I had to get kind of like a restraining order on the Scott, the guy from the Kabbalas and the Metrolites and everything. So he can't do this, dude. <laughs> You're making money off of us without our permission. <laughs> So um, Pump Audio is not able to, I watch my royalty statements or my BMI catalog really carefully now. Mm. So, yeah. Interesting. It is, isn't it? Yeah, that is. That can happen. So basically now you're teaching, doing some side gigs here and there. Obviously with the COVID going on, there's not much in way of... Uh, gigging on a regular basis right now necessarily right yeah i'm just doing outdoors gigs right now i think you're the same yeah pretty yeah. much the same yeah did one indoor thing and realized nope <laughs> not gonna do that yeah that was yeah yeah take a break from that 
<laughs> Not too many things you couldn't control inside there. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I'm um, I've d I've done a little bit of streaming online too with mixed results because I'm still trying to work out the technology. <laughs> but I'll figure it out. About the time it's no longer a, a thing, I'll have it figured out. And then it won't be relevant anymore. Yeah, I like I like to be behind the curve. <laughs> you don't want to be too far ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to be innovative. No. Uh, well, I mean, I'm going to close out with a few questions here for you, if you don't mind. All right, I will be succinct. Well, however you want. What is yeah. it about playing music that you enjoy over the years? The the playing part. This is going to sound corny, but um, and I know it sounds like I'm comfortable talking, but I regard music as this. Is, it just sounds like a bad metaphor. So it's my first language. Mm -hmm. it, I, yeah, I, know, I, I get it. I, I kind of I kind of feel sick for saying that because it just sounds like hey, like a hallmark sentiment or something. But it, it's, it's really it's really how I think of it. Um, and like in the past, when I've had relationships and things like that, um, it ends pretty quickly if that person never wants to hear me play. You know, it's, it's not because I want to show off or anything, but it's like, you really want to know what I'm thinking, you better listen to me play my horn. <laughs> you know, it's like, we got to talk. It's like, I got to play my horn. What do you talk? What do you mean? <laughs> um, but it's, it, it's, it's cathartic, you know? Like if, if you told somebody they couldn't talk for five days, that would be like telling me not to play my horn for five days. It's like, what do you mean? Yes. It's got, that's got, it's in there. It's got to come out kind of thing. Um, and I think if I couldn't play my horn for five days, I would be, I would be irritable. I think I would be impossible to be around. Um, every time I start to get that way, like if when I used to drive a car, if I was in traffic, you know, and it's like, wow, what is wrong with people? You get to the gig, you play your horn. It's like, oh, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah. It really does that. It's, it's weird. Um, yeah. in a good way. Yeah, I get um, it. but that's it. That's mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah, you and I were talking, uh, we played at Lincoln park last week or two weeks ago. Yep. All the COVID stuff going on. We were talking about on the way home of how for that two hours, like it's, it's there in the back of your mind, but it's not, it's like we play yeah. and all of a sudden you're like, ah, I played some music. Yeah, you can forget about it for a while. Yeah, with other people, interacting with other people and, yep. um, you know, I mean, for someone who doesn't under, doesn't play music, that's hard to describe of how you're playing off of what someone else is playing. And that's part of the enjoyment. Of well, it's like a convers It's like a conversation. Yeah, that's, that's it, the It really is. It really of, is. Of the process that you really enjoy that, you know, that's why like when you said you played with that one band uh, that I won't say, but they were kind of going through the motions. Oh, You're not yeah. playing off of each other then. Yeah, that's and fun. so it's it's really fun when you realize, oh, somebody changed something there, and now it's going to yeah. make me do this, and it's going to make this person react this way, and like you said, and you, I remember you saying it was cathartic because for a couple of hours there was no thought of covid and different things it was just playing off of each other and everyone what everyone was doing and the yeah. crowd enjoying it and you know that that whole experience definitely yeah now up to another thing i know you enjoy listening to music all styles all <laughs> genres and yeah i know a lot of people say they listen to all kinds of music i got students that say this to me i was like what do you think about opera Ugh, no, why would I listen to that? It's like, okay. <laughs> what about country? Do you listen to country? Really? Do you? Do you really? Really? So, but I do. And I, you know, and I've got students that are constantly pushing the envelope on, on my, on my taste and my tolerance for different things. There's a lot of music that I hate. Um, but I, I do listen. Yeah. I do listen to a lot a pretty broad range. Yep. So what is it about the, um, let's say the music that you enjoy listening to, what is it that you enjoy about listening to music, if that makes sense? I think I was talking to you about this a couple nights ago. 
we were, we were going back and forth in text messaging. And somebody had asked me to transfer an album to a tape. <laughs> and I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, it's like, this is really well produced. It's well recorded. It's on a major label. The guy is singing in tune. All of the musicians are, they're doing their job well. And I hate this. <laughs> and, and I know, I know why it's the things that are over, like things that sound too produced, too thought through where it sounds like there's no spontaneity or no, there's no grit to it. Like there's no truth to it. Mm -hmm. Like they're putting, they're putting on this veneer because it'll look pretty. It's like, no, give me the truth. I'd rather have the truth, the ugly truth than, than some pretty pretense. And I was listening to the album and I was like, Oh God, what did he just rhyme? What? Just why? <laughs> just stop. Michael Franks. It's just stop. Ugh. Um, and I, I would rather hear somebody, I would rather listen to a musician who, who has, so I got to think of a good example of this now. Um, less ability. Like one of my favorite saxophone players is big J McNeely. Not a lot of technique, but man, does he make up for it with power and emotion and, and just out of my way, bleh, that kind of thing, you know, just that raw energy and things like that. Um, I guess I'm offended by music that isn't sincere, but I, I think that's the bottom line. If it's sincere, I'll check it out. Even I, I like this kind of category of music called outsider music, where it, it's music made by people who have no business making music like the shags. I don't know if you've heard of them, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. You know, they were forced into that situation. So that's kind of unfortunate. Um, but, but people who don't have the chops, but are really, really trying to express something, I can get into that. And I know a lot of people find that funny. Um, but I like the sincerity of it. And I would rather listen to that than something that's overly, I would rather, rather listen to that than Michael Frank's. I would. <laughs> I really, I'm not being, I'm not trying to be ironic or anything. I really would. I never well, want to hear Michael. I never want to hear Michael Franks again. Let well, us speak of him. Let us not speak of him any further. I, he's well, just doing his thing. Yeah. I'll bet all of his songs are still about the same thing. Yes. Yes. He's still rhyming with big words. Just why? Why, for, why force that? <laughs> but yeah it's, it's the sincerity of it so you know like one of my students had me listen to tyler the creator the album that won the grammy and i didn't expect to like it and i really really did i need to go back to listen to that again um i really like lizzo um i like billy eilish like for new stuff mm -hmm. um I think there's a lot of new music that's that's really good, and there's a lot of it that I don't like, because it's just product. Yeah, I'm trying to think of um, the last song that I had to write out for a student that just is like this is just dreadfully bad. I wish I could think of what it was, because I remember writing out every note and just thinking it's like, I can't wait to be done with this. <laughs> it's probably better that I don't remember what it was. <laughs> 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 so who are some of your favorite musicians of all time yeah oh any instrument <laughs> a lot of the a lot of my favorite musicians have just been influential but it doesn't mean that i listen to them a lot like mahalia jackson her phrasing mm -hmm. she does a song called walk in jerusalem um where it's it's just just the weird feel between her and the rhythm section and it's kind of swing and it kind of isn't. Is it God knows I'm gonna walk in Jerusalem, uh, sing in Jerusalem? It's just this, you know, it's like, and when you watch her sing it and her whole body is involved in it and everything, it's that's, <laughs> it's like, that's why, I, that's how I want my horn to sound. Um, I really like, I think it's more albums because I, I know that you identify with like the artists like Stevie Wonder and Paul McCartney and people like that. I, I don't do that as much. It's like I can identify with an album mm -hmm. more like the OJ's Backstabbers album or uh, the Shy Lights Give More Power to the People. 
that album is really powerful. I really like the Staple Singers. I didn't know they were a gospel group when I first heard them. Like, I'll take you there. Man. <laughs> Man, Mavis Staples. Um, and I've always thought it would be cool if I could if I could get my horn to sound like somebody like Mavis Staples or um, Philip, Win uh, Philip Wynn from the Spinners. Oh. It's Philip Wynn, right? Was the lead singer yeah. mm -hmm. after CG Camp. Okay. Um, yeah, just that phrasing and that level of expression and everything. Um, or Sam Cooke. So you approach it when you're listening to somebody or when you have listened to somebody in the past. If you like them, you approach it with, uh, well, I'd like to make my sax sound like that. Now, yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, I wasn't listening to music that way. Right. Um, That's one way that has changed over the years is that now you're, you're listening, not just primarily, but when you hear a vocal, you're like, oh, I, I wish I could phrase that way or I wish I... Kind of, or, I, or else I'll just admire it. It's like, I could mm -hmm. listen to that like five more times right now. Yeah. Um, I remember doing that. Like the first time I heard Crazy by Gnarls Barkley, 2006. I, I didn't know who CeeLo Green was. I hear, you hear that song, it's like, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. It's like, whoa. And it's like, you know, you, and you let, you let it finish to the end. It's like, I got to hear that again. That wasn't long enough. <laughs> you play it again like yeah. five, six, seven times. Man. Yeah, every once in a while, a song like that comes along. It doesn't happen often mm -hmm. enough. And, and I explain this to, to my students, too. You know, it's like, how come you don't like more modern music? How come you like all the old stuff? It's like, okay, well, I've been listening to music for about 50 years, actively. Actively and with a lot of interest. And so when I hear something like, um, I'm trying to think of something that, something that's popular that doesn't impress me. What would that be? Um, Ariana Grande. Ariana Grande. Yeah. That's been done a thousand times. I mean, she can sing high notes. She's, she's the next Mariah Carey, as far as I'm concerned. And the thing about Mariah Carey, when her first album came out, it was Whitney Houston had released an album. I don't remember the year, but I was working at Musicland, so it was a big deal. Saving All My Love For You, that first album that she did with the mm -hmm. orange cover. And it took her forever to come out with her second album. I think it caught the label by surprise. It's like, we had no idea this was going to go platinum. <laughs> Your next album has to be really good. And in that void between her first and second albums came Mariah Carey because people were waiting for the next Whitney Houston album and it wasn't coming anytime soon. So Mariah Carey slips in and she goes, I'm Whitney Houston, but I can sing five octaves. <laughs> it's like, okay. And I would, I was never, I mean, she's got range, but it just seemed like pop product to me. It's like, I've heard this before, you know, Minnie Ripperton did it better. I thought, Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. then so then you hear Ariana Grande. It's like, okay, well, this, this is Minnie Ripperton 3.0, but I'm without the quality of material. Yeah. You know, and it's all production. And, yeah. you know, I tried to tell this to students. It's like, you just don't get it. And it's like, I think I do. I think you're the one that doesn't get it. But then I also tell them, it's like, when you're young, the music that you're listening to now is going to be important for the rest of your life because it will turn into nostalgia. And this will, when you hear the song 20 years from now, it will remind you of a time when you didn't have to pay bills and you didn't have to, you know, you didn't have to worry about where food was coming from. Everything was taken care of for you. And so this music is going to be important because eventually you're going to have to pay bills and eventually you're going to have to navigate relationships and deal with difficult bosses and things like that. And that music's not going to mean as much to you but this will. Mm -hmm. Oh so, yeah. That's why I like music of this. That's why I like disco. Yeah. I'm not going to apologize for that, <laughs> but, right. but yeah, I, I think unfortunately um, I always kind of hope that when um, this level of technology, you know, MIDI controllers and everything like that and digital workstations on everybody's computer or on your phone, you know, it would give more people, it would make music more democratic and more people would be able to express themselves and put it up on YouTube and not have to go through a record label. Um, but the weird effect is that it's, it's, it's turned into more production. It's more about production than anything else. And vocalists especially seem to just be going through the motions. It's like, here's what you need to do to win on American Idol. 
you know, get on a high note and hold it and make it look like it hurts. <laughs> okay. And this, and that again, it's, it's the, the lack of sincerity and the over, the overproduction of everything is, is what I just like, I can't, I got to tune that out. That means it's, I find it kind of repulsive. I would rather listen to really bad music than just the mediocre stuff in the middle. Sure. And there, there's so few artists that, that really seem like it's like, I've got something to say. It's got to come out. Amy Winehouse. Woo, man. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, I think if I was going to do what you do and like, and like there's, there's this artist, I'm going to follow everything they do. Amy Winehouse would have been the one, but she never got to make the next big album. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think for me, Stevie and Paul are the only two that I've really ever done that. All the Beatles, you know, anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. But even Beatle-wise, it's still more Paul. Like, I didn't follow everything John or George or Ringo did. It was more towards Paul. And I know we've talked about it. It's because of the melody. Yeah. His, his tunes are more melodic, you know. Yep. For me, anyway, you know, more enjoyable that way. Um, yeah. But uh, what are, who are some of your favorite saxophone Tenor, tenor, let's go tenor players since that's your primary. Um, probably those those ones that I discovered in college. Um, when I was when I was really young, I didn't know much, um, but I found out about Boots Randolph, so I listened to to Boots because that's what I had access to. And then in college, uh, it was that Ben Webster album, Atmosphere for Lovers and Thieves. I listened to that a lot. Um, and the King Curtis album. And I started looking for more King Curtis because there was a lot of energy there, and I wanted to tap into that. Um, and now for saxophone players, I probably don't listen to as many as I should. When I do listen to saxophone players, I, I like the rhythm and blues saxophone playing as opposed to the jazz saxophone playing that, that started happening after world war two and before the Beatles. Okay. So 1945, 46 to about 1962, 63. Those saxophone players, especially the ones that were playing on rock and roll records, rhythm and blues records. And some of those guys like Lee Allen and Red Prysock and those guys, Sam the Man Taylor would put out solo albums. And some of those are pretty good too. But the playing that they would do, it's like you've got, you've got 16 bars in the middle of this tune, you know, cut loose. Some of that playing is just riveting to me. Like the solo on Yakety Yak by the Coasters. <laughs> Man, how does it get any better than that? Man. So you, what you're saying for yourself is uh, you like that type of solo compared to a Giant Steps solo. By, by an infinite margin, yes. Though you and the giant steps and all its talent yeah oh yeah i do but that's listen to the coasters yak and yak type thing uh yep that, that draws you more to yeah what you enjoy in music um I, I, and I don't mind saying more energy, less intellect. Yeah. <laughs> I, I understand that like the, the Coltrane thing and the challenge and the, you know, all of the logistics are involved in coming up with those chord changes and navigating the, that process and coming up with patterns and things. I get it. And there's a lot of work to it. I could probably, I could probably learn to play like that if I wanted to. I don't want to and it's not i don't think it's me being lazy because i'll spend hours trying to imitate king curtis or sam taylor or something like that but i just i listen to coltrane and it's going i'm glad he did that i'm glad that man was alive and i'm glad he had an influence on the jazz world that's not where i belong mm -hmm. a, a lot of times as a saxophone player you, you're supposed to choose between classical and jazz everything in between is kind of like well you're not really serious so that's me not the not really serious all that gray area in between those two poles those two polar opposites yeah yeah. Yeah, that's interesting too because I'm more lean that way too. Like, uh, I like a simple solo or whatever. Like, I appreciate the you know this or that, whatever. But it's still that thing where I'm not. Um, I wouldn't be taken serious enough by the snobs, you know, because. <laughs> yep. I'm not. I'm not sold out over in that area because I would say. 
you know, did you hear that Bay City Roller guitar solo, you know? <laughs> on, yeah, on yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? yeah. And that would disqualify me from, you know, from having a legit opinion about something. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm used to it. I'm just so yeah. used to that by now. So I yeah. get it. So, so that's part of the thing of like when you're trying to tell your students or I've tried to tell my students, I mean, all you can do is in a sense, I know this sounds like a cliche, but you can only be true to who you are. Mm -hmm. as far as being happy in music like because if you're trying to go down to say the cold train wayne shorter or you know all about all these scales and everything but you actually really enjoy somebody else that's totally different you're going to be miserable well yeah and that's the whole sincerity thing that i was talking about that mm -hmm. that i hope to hear from other musicians so if I'm, if I'm not doing that myself, then what's up with that? Yeah. Because that's, you know, uh, at least I found in my life, it's just having fun, you know, playing the music or enjoying yep. it. You know? I mean, you, you go through all those years of trying to fit in or whatever, and then you just realize, hey, I don't care if I fit in. I mean, you still do to a certain extent, but it's not as important anymore because... I don't know the clock's ticking or something like that. And you're just like, yeah, yeah. I just want to have fun. You know, I just, yeah. <laughs> I just want exactly. to, you know, I want to go on a gig and have fun and uh, you know, hopefully the people enjoy it. You know, you always want to make it enjoyable for people, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, because they're paying or whatever, or they're giving their time to come see you. So right. I don't want to throw 4,000 chord changes over them, you know? Um, and I know, <laughs> You know, I've, I've talked to you about this before, too, and I know we've talked about it. Um, like when I've done a lot of those retirement homes gigs, you know, yeah, it's going to be all of me and it had to be you, sentimental journey. But I'm just trying to connect with those people. Right. More than what I want to do. And they, they could care less about giant steps. Right. You know, but yeah. if I if I do sentimental journey for them, that makes them happy. And then that makes me happy playing, you know, to know, like you said, uh, we're kind of like doing a service or something like that for them in a sense. Yeah. And so you walk away happy, you know, you walk, they're happy, you're happy. And well, and when you're playing giant steps, you're just trying to impress other musicians anyway. And there's no winning that battle. No, no, no. You know, especially if you're playing something like giant steps is like, well, Coltrane did it better. It's like, well, yeah. So why even go there? So as I finish out here, Neil, with you, any advice for local musicians uh, as far as uh, people who might want to get into the side musician type scene, you know, that, um, hmm. you know, I, I got a student that's going through this right now. Um, he's going to be a senior and I'm trying to convince him is like a year from now, you want to have this figured out. And I'm trying to tell any student that has that interest is like, I'm, I want to teach you all the things that I wish I had been taught in college as a performance major. You know, first of all, you want to be versatile. You want to be able to do a little bit because you don't know who's going to call. Oh, you play saxophone. We need you on a jazz gig or we need you in the ska band or whatever. You don't, you don't know what the, the call is going to be. So you want to be versatile if you want to get a gig. Um, and then it's like you have to when that call comes, you have to have your chop. You want to know your scales. You want to be able to play in different keys. That's that's fine. That's what we're working on in lessons. But that's how you get the gig. If you want to keep the gig, this is the other 50 percent that they don't tell you. You show up early. You help the drummer load in. Nobody needs a saxophone player. Some some jazz groups do. But, you know, like a rock band or a blues band. If you've got a four-piece blues band like Rock and Billy and the Rhythm Riot, they're adding a saxophone player. If they're getting 400 bucks on the gig, everybody gets 400 bucks. They add a saxophone player, everybody takes a pay cut. That's the effect I have on bands as a saxophone player. So how, you know, knowing that, how do you make yourself valuable? You help the drummer load in. You wrap up mic cables at the end of the night. Um, you mingle with the crowd. You make table tents. You know, anything that you can contribute, you can help write out charts, um, draw logos, make posters, whatever. Make yourself, make yourself valuable. Uh, 
get, try to get yourself to the points where that if, you know, if they want to get rid of you, here's what they're going to lose. They're going to lose this and the, not just the saxophone, but this and this and this. Nobody's going to help load in drums anymore. Nobody's going to help with sound checks. Nobody's going to do the set up the live recording equipment, all that kind of stuff. So be ready to work harder than the drummer has or the, the guitarist has to, for instance, mm-hmm. you know, you got to You have to be a good player, but then you got to pull a little bit of extra weight because you're the extra player in the band. Yeah. Yeah. And be somebody that everybody can get along with. Because it's not enough to be a good player. <laughs> you know, if people don't like you, you're not getting called back. If you don't show up on time, you're not getting called back. If you have an excuse for everything, you're not getting called. You know, it's just all these things. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I used to uh, remember uh, being new on the gig, sitting in, you know, back in those days and just staying quiet. And maybe I didn't like the tune that they were calling or whatever, but they hired me to play and they don't need my opinion on whether I like the song or not, or any of that. You know, yep. um, well, that's, that's the thing too. And I've, I've had students like that. Um, I've had a couple of students where, you know, I, I give them, I give them a book that I make called the short list. It's got, these are the 12 songs you need to know to consider yourself a jazz saxophone player. And it's satin doll, sea jam blues, summertime. I got rid you know, and all those songs are in there for a reason. I got rhythm because it's a basis of rhythm changes couple of blues tunes because you need to know blues forms you need to have a ballad you have to have a bossa you know something that girl from Ipanema because people see a tenor that's what they expect to hear take five that's what they expect from an alto and I've had students tear pages out of that book it's like I refuse to play this song it's like okay that's fine you're gonna have to be a leader then <laughs> yeah because if, if you're a side man you're gonna be asked to play that and how are you gonna react it's like I just won't do it okay you need to be a leader then you need to be a band leader. I'm not going to tell him. It's like, how dare you? <laughs> it's like, well, then you're going to have to put your own band together and you're going to have to tell other people what to do. And there are plenty of people willing to do that. You're going to have to be the one calling the shots because everybody else is going to want you to play this song if you're in their band. You're going to have to know Girl from Ipanema. I refuse. Okay, put your own band together. Yeah. Because <laughs> it, it takes a wide variety of personalities. I'm not the kind of personality that's going to lead a band. Because I don't like to tell people what to do. <laughs> but if, if you're on the gig, if you've accepted a gig from a band leader and they're calling Cab Driver, I hate that song. Um, it's just boring. It needs the lyrics. There's a story. And the, it doesn't have a good melody. The chords aren't interesting. Sorry, Cab Driver. I just, I don't like the song. But if you're on a gig and somebody calls, Josh does this because he knows I hate the song. We're, we're going to do cab driver in all 12 keys. <laughs> Start the key of G and it modulates up half a step until you get through all 12 keys. Okay. If I don't like it, I should put my own band together, right? Yep. That's the end of that story. If you yep. want the gig, this is what you do. <laughs> and especially if the crowd likes it. <laughs> uh, they just like watching me squirm at that point. <laughs> Josh just made Neil play cab driver in all 12 keys. It's like, well, Neil, I thank you for taking time out today or this evening to yeah. share your story. Thank you. thank you for validating my existence with an interview. I, I, I just find it interesting. <laughs> I find it very interesting. Um, things that musicians go through and experiences and things like that. And, yeah. Uh, Somebody's going to have to interview you one of these days, Troy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be at Vanderveer Park a week from tonight from 6 to 8 30 6 30 to 8 why do i get eight. that wrong every time show up at six anyway i'll be there at six <laughs> yeah it's only two blocks away <laughs> yeah six to six thirty to eight yep and for your students that want to be leaders i'll be there at five thirty. see or maybe even around five so that's part of being the when the, the, yep. the giddy has your name on it, that's part of the responsibility. So and maybe you got to make sure everybody gets paid, even if you don't get paid. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so if somebody doesn't show up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate it, Neil. And, thank you, uh, Troy. Thank you. And I will talk to you later. 
Sounds good. Adios, Neil. <laughs> Adios. <laughs> I almost did a grito. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't want to peak my meters. <laughs> 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 all right Neil, we'll see you later <laughs> thanks try <laughs> <laughs>